three, two. Oh my God. Uh, what's up? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the program. The Airtime Podcast is presented by Van Shoes since 1966. There's nothing fake about it. Have something to believe in and be yourself. You know what I'm saying? All right. Uh, welcome back to the show, everybody. Uh, we have a legendary filmmaker. Um, the more I did my homework on you, the more I was like, damn, dude, I can't screw this episode up. This guy's been in uh, the business for a long time. Every time I like run into you in the backcountry, I'm always like, fuck yeah. Gabe Langua, everybody. Legendary filmmaker living in Pemberton, BC. Been in the game for uh, way, way too long. Decades. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Huge fan of your work. Right on, man. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm super stoked to be here. The booth is looking super sick. Really like what you've done. I love all the like epic memorabilia and... Yeah, like you were saying, from your time frame, so it's definitely a, a stamp and that is you, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, totally. Uh, thanks for the lens on camera one here, the wide angle, is, so thanks for giving me that for cheap. I even knocked you down a couple bucks. <laughs> I said, I got to do this. I'm Ukrainian, man. I'm going to hit you with a lower number, and I don't know if you're going to like it. Uh, it's <laughs> all good. Like- I'm like such a pushover when, it's, when it comes to selling camera gear. I like definitely just want to make the sale and get it done. Move on to the next, I guess, which is a problem. Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, selling things on Facebook Marketplace and stuff like that, shit's a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, I think. And especially just like camera game, too. It's like it's so hard to be future proof. And um, I feel like you're always kind of like chasing that next best thing that's like going to help your, I don't know, just your filmmaking or the image that you're trying to capture kind of like get to that level. You know, it's like one camera can't do it all or one lens or whatever so it's just this like constant chase let's uh let's start with a really wild uh question how much money do you think you've spent on camera gear total ballpark (laughs) since the beginning Uh, man i don't know i mean until i got into film or until i got into digital it was like not that much um like because i started in film I didn't really ever shoot with a video camera before I like was into snowboarding, got a opportunity to like, um, uh, basically shoot my buddy when we went on a trip to Chile with a film camera, like a 16 millimeter Bolex, just like that one right there. And, uh, with 10 rolls of film that was given to me. And so then when I came back, like I just roll and then the next year, um, I just rolled right into a job shooting snowboarding cause I knew snowboarding. So before that it was like, Oh, I spent like 2,500 bucks on a bull X and then like five grand on an area after that. And then, and then actually a super 16 was probably, I think it was like 12, five for like a good set, uh, two lenses, a 12 to one twenty. um, super 16 bull X, but it was like the crystal sink with the motor and the, um, intervalometer had a really six entry wide angle like 5.9 so that was really cool but then once red came out and i was like moved away from the film world and bought into that, all that shit it was like fuck man i probably spent like a 100 grand or something ridiculous you know the first red that we bought i bought with whistler creek productions i bought with um sheen campos and Stu, and it was like forty five thousand dollars us because you had to like buy this package and it was like the first thing you couldn't just buy the camera it was like so compartmental compartmentalized and modular so you had to like build it all up and it was like this forty thousand dollar thing it was ridiculous the crazy thing to me about digital cameras um is the buttons and the options were like you know you look at a bolex or like your dad's handy cam or whatever it's like there's a couple buttons, but for the most part, it's like it's fairly simple, like straightforward. And then when you get into like the options with digital or it's endless totally. and it's like so overwhelming. Like whenever I see anybody like Vitaly working on his red camera and I'm like just watching, I'm like, this is insane. This is like computer <laughs> programming or something like that, which it kind of is. You are programming like the camera had to like take in the fucking 
Totally. I, that's the one thing I have to say about the red cameras, though, is like their user interface is like even when you look at like your settings, you're looking at your shutter, you're looking at your frame rates, whatever, or your ISO. It's like it's all pretty comparable to like running that Bolex. You know, you'd look at the film speed, you'd look at like what frame rate you're going to run. I mean, pretty much run 180 degree shutter. So it was like it's very simple and the and the menu is very simple. It's not like a Sony that's got like 25 buttons on the side of it and like who knows what each one does and you hit one it screws the other one up or whatever, you know. So the red is definitely like the easiest one to use even though it seems the most technical, but it's actually not. But to me it's just they all look like a fucking Batmobile. You know what I mean? They just look so badass that I'm like when I see somebody working with it, I'm like, whatever you do, stay the fuck away from that guy with all, the, <laughs> like, shoot natural selection this year being posted up with like Aaron and stuff like that, and seeing like the camera, it looks like a fucking bazooka. Yeah, <laughs> I'm totally. like, I'm like, don't fucking fall over and hit that guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> looks like a hundred thousand dollars worth of gear, and I'm like. I always say shitty jokes, and before I know it, my shitty jokes kind of lead me into, like, moving my hands weird, and I knock his camera over, and I'm like, uh-oh. It's easy <laughs> to get into that, like, yeah, it's easy to get fall into that camera flex thing. Like, I got to have this to, like, you know, make my stuff look like that or whatever, and definitely the more I have go on and on, I'm like, definitely that's not the case. I, I actually just had a beer with Sean Aaron. Have you ever met him? He's like Maybe. legendary filmmaker or legendary camera guy from California. Um, worked on so much stuff. Like I've got a ton of respect for the dude. But we had this conversation. Like we both bought in. Like at the red epic time, you know, was constantly chasing it, spending so much money, and you know, he was just like, I. It makes me. It makes me sick how much money I spent trying to like chase this like perfect image, you know. And then at the end, it's like, really, it just comes down to like you, what you do and how you make the camera move and all that stuff. Okay. So what is like the Bentley, the Ferrari, the Lambo of cameras? Is it the red or is there like... Well, it depends. I mean, like, I think for action sports, a red is like a really good unit because it's pretty bomb proof. It's like got a ton of weather seals. The new ones are real small. The image is great. Some... You know, you can make, you can manipulate it. Even when you go into a color house, they're like, it has the most dynamic range. So like dark spots, the light spots and everything in between. But if you work on like, say a friggin' Ford commercial in the city, it's like for sure they're going to say an Aerie Alexa and whatever. Yeah. Alexa for sure is like the Bentley. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Maybe let's, let's shoot this back. Um, childhood, uh, a young Gabe. How you got introduced to, to snowboarding in this whole world that you've just given 30 years of your life to. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I grew up in um, the southern Okanagan in British Columbia. It's like Canada's only desert. So it's not like what you would visualize when you think of British Columbia snowboarding. It's like a miniature version of Big White. And so it's like... Yeah, very south facing. It was a mount. It was a mountain called Mount Baldy. Um, my parents were, um, yeah, just like not very well off. Like we lived up in the hills. My dad was like super sporty guy, awesome dude, and um, he got into windsurfing. So he was like all into that. He'd windsurf in Skaha Lake, like in the winter in a dry suit. Was like pretty badass dude. And um, I was super into skateboarding as like a young, like kind of. 10 year old 12 year old type of thing and he saw in a magazine a advertisement for like a snowboard and we had been up skiing on the ski resort a few times you know actually I think my at this point my parents had even maybe not they maybe had bought our first ski cabin up at that hill and so skiing was a big part of our lives but skateboarding was equally as part of a big part of my life so yeah anyways he showed me the the picture in the magazine he's like i'm gonna make one of these for you so he took like our little skis and like stacked like four of them together and like made this like piece of plywood and like <laughs> yeah a couple bmx inner tubes on the feet and like we lived up in the mountains so we kind of had this like little hill in the backyard and i had this like photo of me doing this like suitcase method it was so sick although i've lost that photo so it's not like i have proof of it but it was Fuck. Such epic times, man, for sure. Uh, really 
grassroots way to find snowboarding that's for sure and then at my local ski hill there was only one other guy that snowboarded and there was like a couple other people in the south okanagan like at apex that had snowboarded so it was definitely new this was like 1990 i think or no not even 1990 sorry 87 and um yeah so anyways uh this guy jim the one snowboarder uh, I just like latched onto him and he was a skateboarder too. So he was older. I definitely like looked up to him and just latched onto everything that he did. And then it just kind of like went from there. Every, all the parents were like snowboarding. You got, you got to have a leash on that thing. Nothing's going to kill somebody. Like it's going to fly off your feet. And um, like friends of mine, their parents were like, Nope, you can't snowboard. Luckily my dad was so cool. And he was the one that like gave it to me that um, yeah, it was, it was easy for me to like, fall in love with it that's for sure what was your first board um my first that board your dad didn't make no totally that one sounded awesome no totally <laughs> so we went back east my uh grandparents are from quebec my dad was from quebec my mom's from um san francisco and so my dad uh he made uh yeah we were back at christmas time um and my aunt and uncle had this place at one of these like ski resorts in the laurentians and um, they bought me this board that I've never seen again. It's, it was called a lightener and it was just this like kind of fishy thing, but it just had like a half circle cut out of the back. And it was like very, like almost looked like a crazy banana. And then, um, had these like b- Velcro buckle things for bindings and like super thin high backs. It was such a piece of shit, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, anyways, it worked. I ate shit a lot. And it was funny in the backyard of the cabin, lots of powder was totally like getting it. And then we'd go into Quebec, like up onto the hill where it was just like that. And I was just like heel side scorp, heel side scorp. It was like the worst, you know? Damn. Who do you recall being like your favorite, your first favorite boarder? Uh, Craig Kelly for sure. Cause like that era, that was, I think I didn't even really know about like pro snowboarding or magazines or snowboarding or anything. But the only thing that reached us just living in that like kind of rural area or whatever was like, you know, Burton's kind of advertising. So yeah, it was Craig Kelly, I guess. No, it was before Craig Kelly. I guess it would have been actually, um, it would have been the Sims time. So it would have been Terry Kidwell. Yeah. Terry Kidwell. (laughs) Yeah. Who was your first favorite? Who was the first one that you idolized that you were like, okay, I'm about this. That's like, you, you want to get pictures on the wall. I think that was Craig Kelly. Sick. yeah totally it was craig and then um yeah just kind of like that burton era even though i never actually owned a burton for like so long i ended up with all these kind of like used boards or whatever but um yeah it was definitely craig and then and then jamie lynn was coming into the scene and then he was like the dude and definitely my dude for sure yeah those two jamie lynn craig kelly when i think about like style i mean you threw terry kidwell in there and it's like yeah hell yeah but like craig kelly and uh jamie lynn's style till this day yeah is still like if you're a filmer what you film snowboarding for 20 30 years or whatever yeah. we're going back 30 years right now the methods that both of those individuals had st- stood the test of time forever it's like the most timeless shit like i see photos of those two and i'm like if that wasn't a magazine today i'd be like yeah great method that should be published like yeah, it was, 100%. it's insane it's so sick too you, and you just said it right there it's like it, they're like the two different styles and both and their turns and everything. Like it's not just their like airtime. Um, it's the it's the on ground time too. You know, it's it's uh, it's cool that people like that have like you know transcended through the whole time. Oh, I'm really glad that you picked up on that because I think that's a really interesting note that you as a filmer realize that it's not just about the airtime. It's like the way you flow into the feature. And the way you flow out of the feature. Totally. And there's definitely uh, almost a segment when Craig Kelly did the real big push for f- a free riding. Yeah. That he kind of encapsulated that whole, like the flow aspect. For sure. That was like pre snowboard park times, you know? So like that pre snowboard park times is like, you were kind of just making it like, what was the coolest terrain that seemed like it made sense for snowboarding, you know? So I feel like that just like made snowboarders just that much better. It's like, or just maybe just think outside the box a little bit more, you know what I mean? And uh, I think a lot of stuff was created. It's like, we were talking about it before. It's a time and a place. And I think 
just yeah it's like certain times certain place it just builds that you know perfect algae that makes the like insane snowboarding happen you know what i mean oh i i get it it's like yeah the flow into the feature and then the trick and then the flow out to me it's like they all complement each other to being the shot yeah for sure And like there was definitely a time period where it just seemed like do a double cork 1080 every pro was trying those and it was just about like in the air and then if you land it it's like and it's good totally but i feel like snowboarding more than ever right now especially with the folks that you've been filming like mickle ben ferg etc the list goes on Mm -hmm. they're bringing that whole flow aspect into like free riding but then they're doing the free ride tricks like 720s it's off the natty stuff so then you're getting the whole ride into the feature the trick and then the ride out and there's just that shot there's just so many opportunities to show a rider's like unique approach yeah totally it's it's interesting with snowboard films because it's like you try to make it's how does the viewer look at something like that and then they look at the same thing happening in a snowboard park that doesn't really know a lot about snowboarding how do you tell them that this is so much fucking harder you know what i mean and this takes so much more skill even though it's like a 720 in the park and a 720 down a powdery face seems simple you know and so trying to take that uh, trying to you know capture that and make people realize that is a it can be a difficult thing that's for sure really difficult i don't envy filmers too because like the whole like the rider comes down and they're like oh how is my clip and you're like Maybe it felt good for you, but shit did not translate over here. (laughs) Yeah, totally. (laughs) Um, I usually don't say it like that, but yeah. (laughs) Oh, you're one of those nice filmers. You're like, ah, do it again. No, no, no. No, I definitely like to say it. Definitely like to tell it how it is. But yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's important. I mean, you got to love people that are look at it and they're like, no, I want to do it better. Or they have the total like realization. They're like, I don't think I can do it better. And I'm smarter than just trying to like go in blind and just keep fucking beating myself down. You know what I mean? That was fire Gabe. I (laughs) right. That's an expert level border. It's like they come down, they look at the shot. They realize that the filmer and the rider, even if they both do their best, it's not going to be the shot that they either of them want. And then there's a, you just have to be a vet to be like, pack it up totally like sometimes the feature is epic but there's just no way the filmer can move around to capture the moment that you're trying you're not getting off the snow high enough totally there's no angle to show the pop even though you are going big but you're doing like a long dart air where you're not getting off the snow high enough i've rasmus like the older mentors when i got kind of brought on were like the first to like teach me that like this thing's kind of bombed out it's not looking that good anyway but the rookies will just be like, I want this front 10 tail so bad. You're like, and you as a filmer who's been doing it for a while, you're like, that shit ain't going <laughs> to, it's not going to happen. We ain't going to use this anyway. <laughs> yeah, totally. Or it's just like, it looks sick in the air and I wish you could get it, but the, the landing just isn't there and it's just not going to happen. You know what I mean? But there's like, you know, that young border and people that still think that they can fucking make it through. Oh, the hardest thing as a filmer, I'm sure is like, when do you speak up to these younger kids to be like, okay, I'm, I think you should stop. Yeah, totally. You know what I mean? And it's like, do you feel like that you have that responsibility? Uh, you, someone like yourself is only out there filming the best rookies that are on the come up. So it's like, do you just trust their ability? Like, there's definitely some clips that I've seen of like Kazu with a blown out landing, but then he lands and you're yeah. like, you're like, oh, I guess as the filmer, you're you're stoked you didn't tell him to stop. But then if somebody knees themselves in the face and you kind of saw that coming for a while, you're like, fuck. Totally. Yeah, I think like... For sure you tell them, you know, I think it's like honesty is the best thing. And I I feel like I've been pretty lucky for the, especially the last bunch of years since I started working with like a, a like a crew. They've, I've been in a, a setup or with the crew where there's been these mentors, like a little bit older dudes that have done it all, like Mikey, Rents and Solars or whatever. And so they've been able to pass that information down to like Cicerelli, like dudes like as talented as it gets, you know, and he's strong as hell. And. But, you know, he doesn't totally know how it works in certain snow conditions or different angles or like trajectory or like, you know, pop into a landing or whatever. You know, it's like it's it's that information that those guys are able to give that really like makes it happen. It's like I look through the lens. and I'm like, that looks sick as hell. You're getting tons of pop. Keep going. But I mean, unless it's super dangerous for him, for sure. Totally. I mean, those are two great mentors right there. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned mentors there let's go back to a young Gabe who is 
Gabe ends up moving to Whistler. <laughs> you know, who is the like at first, maybe we can even go before that. It's border Gabe moving to Whistler. What was it like when you first got here? Like, who were the individuals you were looking up to before you picked up a camera? Because before that, you were just a fucking border. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> doing suitcase grabs. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, yep, definitely. Snowboarding brought me to Whistler before being a camera guy. Like, um, I absolutely love it. And definitely the lifestyle and everything that it brings. And just being in the mountains is absolutely nothing like it. But um yeah, so my best friend growing up, this kid named Chris Dima, he was honestly one of the best free riders ever. Just didn't really have it socially to like put it together. But if he had it socially, his skills were like honestly almost unmatched. He was just such a powerhouse, so strong, like insane free rider. Um, but yeah, just socially a bit of a just it wasn't there for him. Um, I met Rube Goldberg. Um, yeah, so those two dudes. And, um, I mean, there was the other guys, but I was never really affiliated with them. Like guys like Sheen and Browner and Al Clark and, and those dudes, um, always like wanted to co hang with those guys, but they were definitely like the cool squad that was way ahead of me. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So as far as snowboarding, like Ruben and, and Chris or Ruben and Chris were definitely like my guys that I'd like ride with a lot and. And, uh, and I looked up to so much and it was cool cause we were kind of like the underground squad too. So it was pretty fun. How did you juggle? Like, I'm just wondering what was in your mind one time you're like, you grab this camera and you're like, I'm going to film, but there must've been a part of you that was like, but I fucking want a board. Like well, if you're looking up to it. Browner and shit, like how did you make that call? Totally. Like I, yeah, I, I wanted to, I wanted to be a pro snowboarder for sure, but I just didn't quite have it. I was even like filming with the treetop dudes, like second wind era and, and, uh, had some days out there, got some clips, had some clips in the intro and everything. And, and so I was like, I think I got it, but I wasn't making any money, you know? So, um, luckily that story I told you about going to Chile was from, uh, my buddy Rick Johnson. So he was making these like low budget films and I was snowboarding in them. And he gave me the 10 rolls. I went to Chile. I came back. It ended up being a segment in his movie. And while we were there, we met, there was a snowboarder trip. And um, so like Sheen and Joey McGuire, David Benedict. And so all these dudes, I filmed them. They were in the movie, in RJ's little movie. So it was like, oh, it was kind of inspiring. I was like, damn, I picked up the camera. I got a, like a part in the movie. It was kind of sick. And it had a vibe. We shot all this like cool Chilean, like Santiago footage. And like, it was definitely a lot rougher and a lot different than anything else he had. Um, and then the next year he was like, look, dude, you're not making any money. You want to be out there still. Like I'm basically getting a new camera. I'm, I'm going to be making the next treetop movie and I'll give you a paying job. So I was like, okay, fuck. I kind of have to do this. And it's the only way I can still get out there and I'll still get to do a couple runs and, but the first year it was like this mental battle of like, damn it, I, I still want to be boarding, but I got to point this camera and blah, blah, blah. But then I fell in love with it for sure. And luckily, like I knew snowboarding pretty decently because of, you know, moving out wet or moving out to Whistler that it gave me a bit of an edge behind the lens for sure. I definitely feel like the best filmmakers, especially in action sports, come from somebody who was passionate about it since like birth or y youth. Totally. You know, just jumping into the camera game at 25 and be like, I'm going to be a professional snowboard filmer. It's just like, it's kind of harder than that. And it's, it. there's some people who've done that and I've been out there with them as photographers and filmers. And it's painful because there's just things like culturally that they just miss. You're just like, you're like, oh, I'm going to go off this thing and I'm going to do like a, me a melon and then I'm going to go into and do a frontside grab and then I'm going to do this and then a back three. And as a filmmaker or a filmer, you're like, oh, OK, like I have a general idea of how you're going to do this because I know all those tricks. I used to do back three indies, so you're probably going to drift into this pocket. Mm -hmm. Gives you a way better idea of how to film or shoot it. I mean, my favorite filmers to be out there with are typically somebody that you can communicate easy with because they get it and totally. they've done it. Totally. Like, I have so much respect for Rusty. Like, I'm so psyched that he became a filmer. Like, he's obviously so good at it right away because, man, the dude was, like, the most insane snowboarder. So it's cool seeing people roll right into that. And it's like there was almost no transition. You know, he had to figure a few things out. I'm sure he blew a few clips. But, like, all in all, he does really good, you know? It's sick.
So you go from treetop, you figure it out, you're like, fuck yeah, I'm going to be a filmer, I'm into this now, although every once in a while there's no way you're not like, I kind of want to hit this jump. Exactly. <laughs> but if you get a call from Absinthe, how did that happen? Uh, that was from Sheen. Um, yeah, that was all from Sheen Campos because Sheen was filming for the the um, the treetop movie the year before and then he needed a filmer basically and in Whistler and I was kind of like the new up and coming filmer or whatever. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so Sheen got me in there and um, instantly like the first month. Um, yeah, I met Justin Hosnick over the phone. Very like long, uncomfortable pauses. Um, he's just kind of a misty dude and man of very few words type of thing. So I didn't know if he liked me or hated me. And I was like so confused. But um, yeah, I was super grateful to have the opportunity that's for sure obviously absent like give me a break um so yeah the first movie we did i believe was saturation that was the first one i moved on or i worked on i should say what a banger <laughs> too saturation is so sick so sick and that uh cover photo of nico like hand plant on the stump was like insane scott sullivan i think yeah that was a definite that was fuck capturing any of that so who who did you film with primarily yeah so it was Sheen Campos, but then right away, Justin called me and was like, hey, I want you to go to Europe and go meet Vole Nivelt and uh, Steven Gruber. And so I was like, okay, sounds good. So like got me a ticket and um, and rolled out there. Never been to Europe, never really traveled on my own either. So it was kind of a big deal was meeting him and Scott Sullivan and Roll out there, and I spent like a month in the Zillertal Valley with uh, with Wole and Steve Gruber, and just like it wasn't the most insane conditions, and and we hit those guys hit some jumps, and it was cool, and we definitely got some footage. But then the highlight was, um, Steve had kind of like had to leave for some reason, like sponsor commitments or something like that, and then Wole was like instantly, he's like, okay, this is my time, and his dad had. Um, he was like a, a dam engineer cause that whole valley has got all these like crazy dams everywhere. Right. So he had the key to get into these dams. He's like, yeah, um, I kind of just want to do this on my own or whatever. So we went into one of these dams and huge, huge, like dam, how you could picture it, you know, these like concrete walls or whatever with these like benches that would go down. And yeah, he just started sessioning these like kind of wall ride things. And it was kind of insane because he was like drifting so far because there was so much like downhill space to it. It was really sick. And um, we hit one and it was like, yeah, it was pretty successful. It was pretty cool. All right, that's awesome. Went home or whatever. Spent a couple more days at home um, in the Zillertal. And then he was like, I think there's this other one. So we went to this other one and it was so sick because it had these like little bunker houses like all along the way. So they had like natural hits where he could air up and there was like three that lined up in a row. So it was super sick. Like from down below, it had this like perfect up uh, angle that showed like the whole dam. And he would just come blasting out behind this, behind this little, like little bunker house and like do a crail land. And it was kind of like dusky when he finally figured it out. So when he'd land, there was all these like little rebar um, tabs that would come out, like little thin pieces of metal from like the structure on the on the concrete. And he would basically land into it and sparks would go flying out of his edges or whatever. And then he'd fly into the snow and he'd like do the same thing, but he'd do like a big layback. And like at the end of it, his arm and his, on his jacket was just like shredded. It was so crazy. It was pretty sick. Definitely it was like a big highlight of that film. And I definitely was super... Yeah, just felt very lucky to be there and very lucky to be able to, like, kind of capture that. I mean, Justin went back, like, the next year and did this crazy cable cam, and it was, like, the most nuts shots ever, but definitely feel stoked that it was a part of the first session. Were you – did you feel comfortable? Like, you know, you a young Gabe goes to Europe. You're with an absinthe crew. Did you feel like, this is fucking easy, this is fun, like, I'm in? Or do you remember feeling like – fuck I don't know anybody here they're all speaking different languages no and that's like... how it is and like uh the sick thing is is that like uh yeah Ger Austrian German sounds like they're screaming at you all the time even if they're happy you know what I mean it's just like so angry they're just yelling at each other yelling at each other yelling at each other and we go snowboarding on the mountain 
and there'd be huge lift lines and they would just roll right up to the front and I'm all just like nice Canadian behind they're like Gabe get over here now we get to the front and like people look at them they'd just be like give them like the mean mug and we'd just like roll the whole line it was so funny that must have been sick to film Vole back then because that was like Vole from like that era to like the next five years was like all Vole like totally, man. filming shit that was kind of ahead of its time similar to like how Blavel eventually made the big push for it's like he was just doing his own thing totally and I, I didn't really realize it until I went back later on and watched his parts and I was like oh like he wasn't following just like this is how you be a backcountry pro snowboarder he's just doing his own thing no and totally resignated too for sure and that guy's just like such a board board sports like specialist like you see him on a surfboard he's like so freaking good insane on a skateboard just like and just one of those dudes that just naturally has it, you know, and, and just oozes style when he does it as well, you know. I was talking to Hosnick for a quick minute, um, uh, probably about a week or two ago when we tried to do this. And yeah, yeah, he had nothing but awesome things to say about you. He oh, said that's that nice. Was a, he said it was a short period, but he said that you were amazing to work with. And then you get you get scooped up by the community project. Yeah. Uh, let, let, how did that come to be? That sounds like a really pivotal moment in your career as well as in all of snowboarding, kind of. Totally, man. I didn't even really know what I was getting myself into, to tell you the truth. Like um, the year before, um, Steve Gruber and Vole, they were they just love like when I went out there, they're like, you're from BC. No way. We love BC. We have snowmobiles there. We love snowmobiling. They were just like they had motos at home, but they're like, you can't snowmobile in Europe. Like it's the best there. Um, so they did end up coming back that year, um, during saturation. And then the next year, which I guess was pop, um, yeah, they came out and it was like, um, yeah, kind of whatever they had, we had some good days and we had some shit days or whatever, but yeah, all in all, it was pretty good. And then they were like, it wasn't insane. So they're like, we're extending our season, like into the spring pretty hard. We're going to stay like till the end of April type of thing. And, um, Justin was... Uh, he said, I'm going to send out another filmer, this guy, Rich Goodwin. And I was like, okay, sounds good. Like pick this dude up or whatever. And I actually, funny enough, I picked him out right in front of Tommy's like right here. Cause it was like, this is where you get dressed up, dropped off with the bus. And, uh, yeah, this guy, Rich, he's just like larger than life, super hilarious guy, lived in Jackson and just super funny and just outgoing, not the best on a snowmobile, but very good cameraman. And he'd worked with Travis a ton. And, um, anyways, yeah, we just, uh, yeah, we hit it off. We just had a super good time. And then long story short, he, him and Kurt Morgan and Travis decided that they were going to break free and they kind of wanted to do their own thing. And Travis wanted to do, yeah, a film that was kind of more based, not based around him, but more his flavor. And awkwardly enough, Travis or (laughs) Rich and Kurt Morgan were going to be co-directors and, yeah, Rich, super nice guy, super talented, everything. Kurt, insane talent, like not a nice guy. And just like, yeah, it doesn't play well with others, really. Um, anyways, so I got to go with them. Yeah, they just asked me to get on, and I uh, I just cruised down to Jackson. Then that next year, hadn't met any of them besides Rich. And I'd met Travis like briefly before, but not at all. And uh, yeah, I just showed up, and me and Kurt actually hit it off super good. And it was a it was a wild time, that's for sure. There's definitely uh, a lot of a lot of energy that went into that film, that's for sure. A lot of passion. So that lineup is crazy. I mean, <clears throat> you got people like Travis Rice, Kyle Clancy, Tyler Lepore, Terrier, Sean White. Yeah. It's like they're that, and those people were the biggest of big at that time. This some of these writers still are. It's just, which is wild, but totally. You as a filmer who's not like maybe the biggest filmer yet, but you're climbing mm-hmm. the ranks. <clears throat> did you feel like, do these riders like respect you? Are they nice? Like, did everybody treat you like good? Or do you feel like some of them are like, I'm a super pro. Like, this is how it should be. Yeah, totally. Um, honestly, Trav was super cool right off the bat. And um, and I didn't actually film, like, I didn't film with Terry. I, I actually did film with Terry now that I think about it that first year really briefly but like sean white that was some other thing and whatever clancy super cool guy those guys were all down to earth and um tyler report tyler lapore fellow canadian me and him got along super good so it was pretty easy honestly like I, I was able to get in pretty good and right away 
when I got there, um, me and Travis spent like three days in this insane storm cycle filming the like intro to the community project teaser. And when we got the transfer back, it was, there was a lot of gold in there and Kurt was like super stoked so that he was all like, Oh, Gabe's the best. Like he was giving me lots of hype and I was like kind of believing it. And I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah. I'm in there. It's <laughs> getting bigger every day. The next day you're hanging out with Sean White. You're like, I <laughs> am the best. Yeah, totally. <laughs> kind of believe in the whole, believe in the whole thing but no it was good man i think i if i would have blown all those shots it would have been a different story but we had it it was perfect conditions and went to everywhere trav did it was like waist deep and we did this super misty like um just storm segment and on jackson on the hill or whatever and it was really sick the, the teaser's dope like you should put it in the show notes for sure will do yeah it's sick let's let's talk uh as if i steal a word from uh the bomb hole big fan um biscuits here kind of some much cheddar biscuits we're talking dough so you get treetop what does that look like like what are you getting paid there absinthe what do you get paid there and obviously we don't have to go into today's world but like you're starting to really scale up here it's not what was much- a filmer getting back then honestly it wasn't that much i think like i think i got like 2500 bucks a month during the treetop times and then it was maybe four grand a month or maybe not even for absinthe. And but then when I went to community project, it wasn't even a step up. They were like, look, we don't have a lot of money. We're trying to spend it on the movie. And like, this is a good chance. And da 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 da. You know? So I think it was like relatively the same as absinthe. Maybe thirty five hundred. It wasn't that much. But cameras were less expensive. You didn't have to pay for any of your film and all your expenses are paid where like throughout the whole winter. So you get to stack that money a bit as long as you don't party too much. And did the whole Curtis Morgan, Travis Rice, uh, you know, you you get what you're getting along with that whole crew. Community Project is a sick fucking movie, and it does really well. Like I remember that totally that coming out and being like, damn. Yeah. So to be a part of that, does that just snowball into that's it, that's all, or did it was like a year lapse, I believe. There was a year lapse in between there because then I came back and start. I worked on whiteout films with Anthony Vitelli. Oh, uh, wear it well. Okay, let's talk that for a second. How was it wor- <laughs> working with Tony? Come on. It was awesome. Honestly, me and Anthony got along super well, and he was really appreciative. I think I like came from Community Project where we had a big like team effort going on, and we like we really like grinded hard, you know. So like I came into wear it well, kind of doing the same thing, and so he appreciated that. I remember him like specifically saying like you're doing a really great job. So that was really cool and. And uh, obviously the lineup was insane and I felt like it was almost a similar situation with uh, Whiteout at that time because it was like, in my opinion, like sure, going with Trav and Community Project and all those guys are epic. But like in my world, because I'm from Whistler, it's like Dev and Mikey and Arrow and like that crew, like they're just as fucking huge as those dudes are. You know what I mean? So that's almost like the, the next level you know what i mean so i was pretty hyped to be a part of it and um yeah i had some good days spent a bunch of time with trevor andrews and and mikey and then um i actually had this i was snowboarding on whistler and i broke my leg and so like halfway through the season i was kind of out for the season so that kind of sucked that definitely took me down a notch for sure and made me think about what was going on and yeah reevaluate type of thing what was your favorite clip that you filmed in White Oak? Just I'm asking this because I fucking love the White Oak movie. I love the footage in the White Oak movies more than the editing sometimes, but like those were my favorite snowboarders. Yeah, nice. So I'm like that lineup to me is like you just mentioned Arrow, like totally. And uh, that name doesn't get brought up enough. Oh, Arrow dude. Nimla, like the fuck. most insane snowboarder, like six not so strong and just could do anything really, like. <laughs> It was freaking awesome. Um, I like I said, my season was like half cut, and it was a long time ago. But my most memorable time of it, I think, was like this morning with Trevor Andrew up Callahan in the morning, and it was just this crazy golden light, and he was honestly going down just like waist deep powder. I can't really remember what happened, but it was just this like really mellow kind of slope. But I think he did some like butters and an air but it was like nothing crazy it was just the light and the snow quality and just trev style i think you know yeah he's he's got a he's got a really good gift for like adding his own flavor to the most simple of tricks like every clip he's ever had to me is like his pop was fucking insane Insane, yeah like 
every clip he has, you like watch it and it's like right before he's all low and then he pops yeah. so big. And I'm like, even me like today, I'm like, damn, I got to work on my pop. Tre- Trevor's been fucking out doing all of us out there. It's so good. And I just love that he like, man, the guy really like without using, yeah, I would, I don't want to say reinventing himself because that's not it. He just like, he just kind of kept going with the times, you know, and any time, uh, he just kept cruising along and he was just, you know, he came from that transition era and he was so good and had such sick style and he didn't do the craziest shit, but he looked so good. His McTwist, like to this day, are some of the sickest McTwists ever done. And, um, obviously his, his clothes, the way he wore it at that time, it was just beautiful. And, um, yeah. And then all of a sudden when he got with absinthe, like he totally like just stepped up and went back country riding and just, yeah, I, I, man, his parts were like legendary in the beginning of his app sometimes. Like those, those are standouts in the whole industry for sure. Oh, to, till his day, I watched like he's, we talk about it to this day. It's like craziest cab sevens yeah. from anybody. He had like crazy cab sevens into like, he has this one off of this like slushy, it's like a gap and it's a step down and it has a super steep short landing and yeah. he does it's the craziest caps into the worst snow ever yes it's like dude if homie would have over rotated that <laughs> Trevor would like he did face a lot of injuries but that would have been a big one yeah totally yeah which is kind of why i think i think that's why he is where he is today it's like i think he had to overcome a bunch of injuries and picked up that piano and look where he is now he's got a great family and he's living the dream so <laughs> yeah no he's a smart dude and I love it. He's just like so down for the culture. And it's sick because, man, the guy's in L.A., like, but he still comes back and spends like a month or two with Kale and Browner, getting to the parking lot at 2 p.m. and getting out there and just doing laps and, yeah, having the best time ever. So it's sick to see that he still does it. I mean, what was it like a couple years ago they built that QP and he was like getting back into the you know, getting back into the McTwists and it looks sick. Like he had the swag on and he's yeah. just doing it. It was so cool. Yeah, my homie Brockle was filming him, and I'm sure he was yeah. just losing his mind I filming bet. Trevor and Kale trying, like, tricks. Yeah, the Like, sickest. the fact that they didn't just go up and be like, we're going to do turns. They're like, let's build a quarter pipe, and I'm going to do a <laughs> McTwist. It's like he hasn't even snowboarded in, like, 10 years. Totally. Like, not actually 10, but, you know, a while. Yeah, that, another actually memorable point of that uh, of that season, that was the beginning of the season, we went to the uh, Hurley Road Gap, and Trev gets up there and and uh he's like yeah we're gonna hit this and it's a big deal and i trev's there i think mikey's there as well rents i can't remember who else anyways we build the big one and trev gets down to his sled and he's like puts on his bulletproof vest he like takes off his jacket i'm like what the hell is that dude and he's like it's a bulletproof vest my dad got it for me if it stops bullets I can't remember the line, but man, basically his mindset was, if it stops bullets, I'm good. <laughs> so he hit the gap with this like lead vest, like Jesus Christ, man. So funny. If you land on that road gap, like Bo Bishop did, it's like that yeah. vest ain't helping shit. It's like going to help if you hit a tree, but like totally. you ain't hitting a tree. You're either hitting a, I don't know, yeah. a cat track or you're going into the pow. Totally. But yeah, he uh, he did it. I think he got what did he get? He got maybe cab five back one or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I feel like I it's cab five back one. Yeah, and Mikey did cab five too, or yeah, maybe um, front five. I can't Oof. remember. I feel bad for not knowing those two tricks. Yeah, but I'd like to shoot this over to uh, that's it. That's all. Two thousand eight, and how that the expectation I guess around that project when you got the call did. I guess did they want it to be the best movie in the entire world? Did they have a a Sean uh, Johnson or Sean Kern's phone call before? I've heard this about, before they started filming that, and he like got the whole crew together and he's like, "We're making the best movie ever. I don't want to see anybody doing five forties. Everybody's doing nine hundreds, and it's like this. Everyone's like, "Fuck! Like we got a bust." And I'm like. Did Travis like call everybody who's the best? It's like if you're filming for this movie, we are gonna film the best snowboard movie ever. And like you as a filmer can't fuck up anything. <laughs> That's pretty much how it was, but it didn't come from Travis. It came from Kurt Morgan, to tell you the truth. He was like, he's like, This is this is my opportunity to like, you know, pave my way into the scene and really, you know, solidify it because community project was a big deal, but it was like because him and uh, Rich were co-directors, 
it what it didn't end up being that way it ended up being like more kurt for sure in the end he was the editor so it made sense um but then yeah definitely that's it that's all it was like okay we're on it like i'm you're we're super stoked to have you back but we're not fucking around and this is gonna happen and and basically the way kurt was taking it was like it was a step beyond what like I knew, you know, he wanted to take it to this new level. Like I knew about being in the back country and I knew about snowboarding and stuff, but Kurt was like, okay, well we're going to get like, you know, these like new camera systems that nobody's ever heard of that they've used on planet earth. And we're going to do these like aerial photography and we're using like, you know, all the latest equipment and we're starting to like, you know, starting to get into like the new age of digital cam cinema cameras. So it was definitely like, I felt like I was learning a lot at the same time. I definitely was like, I don't know all the answers. That's for sure. And Kurt was moving fast. And, uh, and then, <clears throat> yeah. And then Trav for sure was, uh, part of it. Him and him and, uh, Curtis had a tumultuous relationship and then they really like fed off each other, but battled as well, but it made and brought out the greatest stuff, I think. Um, yeah, it was interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a crazy time. Super stoked to be a part of it. That's for sure. It was two years. The first year was wild because they came out of that year in New Zealand with like this most insane footage, like all that crazy aerial stuff that they have was the beginning of it. And it really set the stage for like what we needed to do for the next two years. When you're using these new devices, do you even know what the footage is going to look like, but then you get it back and you're like, that's just what I filmed. What the, well, f cause this shit is fucking like it, at that point, nothing had be had been filmed like that. Like my friends that don't snowboard at all that play hockey, watch that film. And they're like, what the fuck is going on? Totally. Like, well, it wasn't us <clears throat> operating it though. That's the thing. It's like Kurt in a helicopter with a guy that knows what the fuck is going on. You know, Kurt's like, okay, this is snowboarding. This is how we're going to approach it. He's directing or whatever. The thing that I really learned from like that's it, that's all community project, art of flight is like you're kind of just one part of the puzzle. You're just a you were a team and, and really to capture backcountry snowboarding. It's like to have one camera at the bottom of the line looking straight up on a tripod is never going to be the best way to capture it. It's like now we're, you know, in snowboard films these days depends on, you know, what you like and stuff. But I think you know, as many cameras as you can have. And then it gives you a lot of options to cut from different angles. And that one angle at the bottom maybe isn't the one that's going to see it all the best. So that aerial photography, and then there'd be me as the like long lens guy or whatever on the ground. And then maybe we would be lucky enough and we'd have like a side angle or something like that. So that's how I kind of like was in the picture of it all. So think as far as us using the, that new stuff like there was definitely some new digital cameras but as far as the aerial aerial stuff like you know we didn't even touch that stuff that the pros came in for that like later down the road once uh art of flight happened and brain farm was really established they bought all that equipment and we did have our hands on it but in the beginning we didn't but it was really cool to see because we got to learn from the best and when you were filming that project and documenting some of the crazy at the craziest snowboarding that's ever been done, like yeah. mind melting, did you realize that you were a part of something special and you were like, this is going to be fucking mind blowing? Fuck yeah, man. It was insane. Travis was on a tear and every time he stepped up to like those, yeah, any of those like insane kickers that people don't even hit as big today are like... He would just do something groundbreaking, you know, and he had it in his eye. The dude's so fierce. Like, you've seen it because you've got to work with him on natural selection and stuff. And, like, the dude's got a fucking bit of a bit of crazy in him for sure. And and he definitely knows how to um, elevate himself and knows how to bring himself to the next level. I think these days he's a lot more, like, in tune with that. Before, it was just, like, pure rage inside that would just, like, make it happen or whatever because he would take a beating. Like, it would just not be working it out. And you'd be that camera guy that's like, Trav, I just don't think it's going to work a day. And he's like, shut the fuck up. Boom. And then he'd just do, like, the most insane thing ever, you know? He invented so many tricks then, like, the double backside rodeo 10. Like, that trick is insane. The I'm pretty sure he invented that. Did he not? Yeah. If the only reason why I'm not 
saying for sure is because I feel like David Benedict was playing with a lot of those tricks during that time. Totally. So I don't know for sure. Yeah. You'd have to call like Ben Baluck or Pat Bridges. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And then, you know, yeah, you're right. So it was all in that same time. I think maybe the double front side 10 was his. And then that's it. That's all. He doesn't get one of those in that said that's all, but he does that same trick that JP Walker does the front double rodeo nine, I think is what it is into like kind of a hip landing. It's insane. My favorite thing about snowboarding straight up is just landing a trick and then riding out and you got your couple homies on a sled. You got the filmer and the photographer. They know you were battling for the trick and it's like you land that and the photographer knows that you fucking landed that the filmer was like, that was the one totally. all your homies are tripping out. That movie must've been like that. It was so insane. many times throughout the season, like Travis is riding out and you're like, we got another A plus plus. We got an ender today. We got another ender totally. today. It's like I film all year with like a lot of the best snowboarders throughout the last 10 years of my life. Luckily for me, because it's like sometimes I'm like, holy fuck, I'm grateful to be out here. These guys are good. But like that year must have been like there's a couple people who've had seasons like that that are that crazy that have like really moved the needle and. That's it. That's all. Art of flight. A bit of fourth phase, but mainly art of flight. And sure. that's it. That's all. It's like Travis moved the needle into like a new world. Totally. But that was like a two year film, right? So that the first year was like a future. I think we had like three trips. So it was like it was the stepping stone. And then into the next year, it was like ramping up. And we spent a lot of time in Jackson and doing um, and that was the beginning. I'm pretty sure that second year, Trav started the natural selection in Jackson. That's when he had his event. So he had a lot on the plate. He was like changing sponsors that first year. He went from like, I'm pretty sure he started with Oakley and then ended up with Quicksilver like halfway through or something like that. So it was huge change sponsors. He was doing his new, like, you know, mind boarding event that he wanted to do the natural selection at Jackson hole and filming year two for that's it. That's all, you know, the most anticipated snowboard film at that time. And the rad thing about it, and this just like attests to like Travis being able to step up to the plate in the most clutch situations is like the final ender part or trick is the final thing that I think we, as far as jumps is what we shot was like that psycho gap. And he does the back double 10, nose or something like that over it and it was like the final thing that we shot and it's the final thing in the movie it was kind of sick you know he just kept like escalating and stepping it up also like between the crew i'm imagining travis had like a huge say on this but like he would bring on riders who could also step up in clutch situations For sure. you got like scotty Lo like obviously Lago got hurt that one year but like yeah even like bjorn like the people that like mark landvik the crew totally. is endless there Nico, and he, Nico, yeah. Ejack, John Jay. It's like everyone in, that he picked to be in that those movies. McMorris even just like when he was young jumping. It's like these are the people who I know can come and film, hang, and we can all push each other to do the best snowboarding we can possibly do. Totally. And like pretty much every one of them showed up. <laughs> I think you have to. It's like it's yeah, it's eat or get eaten. You know what I mean? It's like. I think you have to step up to that level. It's like everybody has it in them. It's just, you know, who can bring it out in you? And I guess like Travis and Kurt and, and just the situation brings it out where people just really rose to their best, you know? It's pretty cool. Yeah, I think Travis has a gift to do that because you look at like Brian Fox, for example. It's like the best snowboarding he's ever done is alongside Travis. Rasmin, it's like the list goes on and on. People who go and do a day or a week or get to film with Travis for a year push themselves into like, they didn't even know that they could do that. Totally. But like he has a way of probably making, I don't know this firsthand, but I'm imagining he has a way of like communicating, making you feel comfortable and having like the ability to make you be like, I can do this. For sure. And he's so good at breaking it down. Like so good at breaking it down into small sections and then just really analyzing it. And that's what it comes down to. And, you know, reading the risks. So like sometimes it's just like pure brute force and will or whatever, will and grit that makes it, come together for him but he's a very calculated dude at the same time like man especially with these days when it comes to line riding it's like the amount of memory and visualization is just like out of this world 
Do you have one story from filming with Brain Farm that sticks out to you? Because, I mean, there's probably a thousand million of them, but is, is there <laughs> any one of them that you're like, this is the craziest fucking day that ever happened? Like, they had helis filming helis and sledding and, like, building these block jump things that nobody's ever... Like, it was just, like, the most, like, fucked up... It was like Hollywood making a snowboard movie. It was, yeah. like, the production level was so fucking big. So were there any, like, days that you're like, this was the craziest day that... <laughs> fucking <laughs> yeah i mean i i know that like i can't really pinpoint it to tell you the truth it's like every other day was like that so they all kind of melt into one especially when it came down to like um sledding missions like yeah. those were probably insane yeah for sure you know the sledding missions weren't that insane the fourth phase i was able to come back for one month of the four years that they shot for it uh sorry two months one month in jackson one month in alaska and uh so, um, that one month during the fourth phase, I came into it. Not, I hadn't seen those guys in a while and I'd been talking to them for sure, but then luckily got, had the opportunity to come in and they had such a huge crew. Anthony Vitelli was there and this, uh, yeah, they had probably like, I think our crew at some point was like almost 30 people, including riders snowmobiling into the back country at four 30 in the morning. And like at the time during that's it, that's all. Like it's interesting. That's it, that's all. Those jumps in Jackson where they were all filmed within like, I'd say a kilometer square radius. Not two kilometer square radius. It's so crazy. It's this one spot. You come in. It's a drainage that comes down like this. And then there's just boom, like three gullies that go through. And it looks like. It's like if you're driving through Kamloops and you just see the hillside, you're like, fuck, if that was covered in snow, that'd be the sickest snowboard park ever, right? <laughs> Think that every time I drive through there. Totally. So that's what it that's what it was like. And it's literally grass underneath and it just had these perfect like gully pop, uh, you know, takeoff here, landing there. And they just went all different directions. And Trav just connected them. He just made like, boom, gap over this one. This one goes tabletop. This goes here. This goes there. And then, so community project, that's it, that's all. And a lot of the jumps in Art of Flight, they're just like the most perfect jumps for just doing groundbreaking tricks. So it was pretty cool. Um, when it came down to the fourth phase, though, those guys were like, okay, we did this for like three years or three different films. We need to move on. So Trav really like put his energy, put the work in. It's not as easy as in Canada. There's a lot of like, um, land use restrictions as far as like motorized and stuff. So it bottlenecks you pretty hard, but there are some spots, but they're really pretty gnarly to get into. So long approaches and, um, yeah, gnarly hill climbs through like gully trees and shit like that. So when you're going out with like nearly 30 people and half of them, like, honestly, were like really terrible snowmobilers. So it was just a clusterfuck, like beyond belief. It was crazy. <sighs> I couldn't imagine being three films deep that, and all of them are like multi-year films. Did you get kind of burnt out at the end? Were you kind of like, I could switch it up from this or do you feel like this is, this is my shit? Um, no, I was definitely burnt. I was definitely ready for a change, a uh, change of scenery. I wanted to get back to BC. So like over all those years, it's like, yeah, there was like in between community project and that's it, that's all. I did wear it well, so it's back in BC. And then in between that's it, that's all and Art of Flight, I was back in BC for the most part. And then I went and shot with Travin for like a month um, for an absent thing um, in Jackson. But I really miss being in BC. I miss being home. And I was like always just like, fuck, we're filming all over the place, but BC is the best spot. So I really missed it. And then, uh, me and Blavelt got to just, yeah, having a having one trip together um, during that's it, that's all. Definitely became you know friends, and then um, Art of Flight uh, had a couple trips together, and just yeah, just became friends. And then basically that's when he was formulating his plan to make his film naturally. He had been doing a series or whatever with Greg Martin, and then um yeah greg just basically asked me if i wanted to be on and it was like the perfect opportunity i wanted to leave and do something else and i had such like i had so much um like interest in what jake was doing and i just love like his free riding and that just speaks to me as snowboarding like that's what i'm into and it was just the perfect storm perfect timing let's talk about that 
Jake's approach to snowboarding. Mm-hmm. What what makes that so special as a fan of snowboarding, as a filmer, as yeah, like touch on just like why you would be so excited to go film with Blaveld. I mean, for one, his like approach is completely different than like the time spent in Jackson. It's like Jackson, you go there, art of flight. It's like we're big and we're digging like a jump for three days so somebody can flip around twice. You know what I mean? It's like to me, it's not that inspiring. It's cool for sure. And it's groundbreaking if you're into that type of thing. But I feel like for me, I was like my first real dude was Craig Kelly. So like that speaks to me. His free riding at that time was like, that speaks to me. And Jake definitely had when he kind of put his foot down and was like, I'm just going to do free riding. I don't want to spend more than five minutes. I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> Um, and it was perfect. It was, uh, yeah, he, just the simplicity of his riding and the simplicity of like what we were trying to do. It was exactly what I was into and I was super stoked to be a part of it. And, um, Jake snowboarding to me is like the most beautiful thing. He's, uh, he's so light. He's such a like light kind of strong dude, but he's just a small guy or he's not a small guy. He's just light, light and strong. He's lean and uh his approach obviously is um it's not straight down it's very side to side you know he's not just like roll the marble down the hill and that's what happens he really you know uh, works the mountain side by side i assume that's like his kind of half pipe background and um but he still has that freestyle element it's not just all about just like you know free ride and doing hippie turns down the mountain so yeah it was just definitely something that i really really appreciate i remember when blavelt like came out with those form parts and then he had that one intro where he's like oh it takes me longer than 30 seconds to build a jump i'd like i'm just wasting my time or yeah, whatever totally. that's not yeah, it yeah, i yeah. butchered it but me too i was like damn like what is this guy talk but then his footage but then the footage plays and you're like whatever you're doing keep doing exactly like and that then it blew up that like approach in a it's bigger than ever now, but like he was a fucking ahead of the curve. Totally, man. And it was so cool because I think you posted it actually on airtime is that back seven off that wind lip. It's like double angle to this day. I don't think I've seen a better natural backside seven. It's like so perfectly executed and the pop and the loft and how big it is. It's so freaking sick, man. That's definitely one of the best natty back sevens. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Like, yeah, and that thing's big too. Rusty's been there to hit it, and he's like, "Dude, you have to haul ass into that thing. Like, really, it's hey? not like a small jump. Yeah. Like, and he's like, and if you deck, it's just flat, and it's kind of like a decine kind of gap where it's like, yeah. if you don't make that thing, like you're gonna blow your knee. Yeah, 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 <laughs> totally. Huh? Yeah, it's uh, it's cool, man. I'm, you know, I think uh, just the whole like naturally the name kind of got overdone and um which is kind of a bummer but it doesn't take anything away from what he does that's for sure he's like definitely a pioneer and it's cool like him and then obviously nico is around the same time and honestly trav like he is just like a didn't have the finesse as those guys but he strived to do that you know what i mean like being out there is like you watch nico and jake and those guys just like dance around and they can kind of adapt to like all that kind of like really playful fun terrain which is something that I think Travis like learned to do, but those guys have always just kind of had it, you know. They're yeah, they're the masters. Leyland was telling me a story one time where him and Mikey went to Europe and they were going to go film Nico, and Nico was just there. It's the shittiest snow conditions. There's nothing to do. Mikey's like, we can't jump into this, and Leyland's like, oh, Nico wants to ride this. I guess I'll film him, and he's doing like these like little butters to like switch back ones and Leyland's like this is kind of just a waste of time and he's like but I'm going to film him cuz Nicholas Mueller he said within like a couple tries it turned into like this he figured out the speed for all the little gaps and then he filmed like three things that he was just like how how are these clips there's like some people can just like make Blake Paul's another great example is really fun to film with him at the end of this year and I was like we were blown away by like just his like eyes and then he would find a cool little gap and you'd be like, that's not that cool. And then he would do a crippler front five on it. And you'd be like, that was the sickest thing I've ever seen. Totally. And you're like, some people just have this like, yeah, they don't need to be like, they don't need to overcomplicate it. No, for sure. Yep, exactly. And I think that's the thing about uh, Jake, Nico, Blake. It's like those guys can 
play around on the little stuff too, but they also can go giant and do huge stuff and make it look so sick, you know? So it's, uh, it's being able to, it's guys like that that really, um, you know, stand out in a way, but it's interesting when it comes to filmmaking. Cause it's like, I think you have to love, you have to know snowboarding. You have to do snowboarding for that to like really, um, you know, resonate with you. If you're just like Joe Schmo, you see it, you're like, Oh, that's cool. You know what I mean? I don't know if it hits as hard. What do you think? I, I just think that if you don't follow snowboarding, if you're not like a super fan and like a student of the game, you overlook like the small switchback three that had like the really cool flavor or like, mm-hmm. like Torstein for a bit there got really creative with like doing crazy weird 180 pokes and stuff. And it was like, I was like, damn, like he's not going massive off these things, but like, that's the flavor you would want off that feature. And not everybody could just make that feature a clip. And so like, that's something special in itself to be out, out there as a filmer to be out there with somebody like Nicholas or Blake or Austin Sweeten, and they can make the little bump to bump a clip. Like that's special. Cause most people who would ride that, it's like they need, you know, big air, but then there's some big air people. It's some people are just kind of able to work certain niches. It's a really special rider that can kind of ride everything. And like you were saying there, like Nicholas, Blake, Blavelt, they're not going small all the time. They're going massive sometimes, but then they know where to place in the butter and the slash. And they re- recognize the importance to make that a well-rounded part that translates and has like a certain feel to it. Cause when you only have like jump, 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 and you don't have any riding that can showcase like your actual style of snowboarding, like it's like, it takes away from the video part. I love a really well-rounded curated part that showcases some butters, some smaller gaps, and then, yeah, like, Sollers always puts this, like, you do want to have some big shit that sep- separates you from, like, why you are actually a professional. Like, you can find the speed on these certain gaps. And, like, some pros are not great at being able to figure out, like, how fast to go. And back to Travis Rice, it's like, he has a gift from the gods to be able to, like, John Jay was pretty close there for a while, too. Like, throw a snowball and be like, this is how fast I have to go down this line. Like, these are the five tricks I have to do down it. I'm going to get into the pocket on each one of them. Like, I, I would just knuckle, ragdoll, hit the rock. <laughs> <laughs> Filmer, we, you and me would be having a conversation at the bottom. Like, I don't think you should do it again, Jody. I'd be like, one more time, Gabe. And you're like, please don't do it. <laughs> Somebody tap this kid out. <laughs> yeah, totally. Anyways, it's, uh, yeah, blah, blah the highest regards he's still still to this day one of my best buds and and my favorite people to film with he's just got so much like uniqueness and it's cool to see him with like the younger gen in the last you know bunch of years that i was filming with them i got to film with him with like baden and his uh nephew and um uh man i'm butchering it right now mason mason jar yeah Yeah, that kid's sick yeah mason and uh and uh the who else am i fucking thinking of here bigger jar yeah anyways it's sick because he would like step up to kind of show those guys like what you can do you know and and they had so much respect for him too it's really cool to see sorry i kind of totally blew that scene right there no not at all um here's a Favorite Jake Blavel clip you filmed? Um, man, I don't know. Honestly, uh, probably just for like the trick that he did because I think it's the most insane thing. Is um, we were doing this North Face shoot up at Tankwell area, and it was like Blake and uh, Jake and Austin Smith, and there was just this like weird rocky lump anyways he does this like front side um i guess you would call it a miller flip he basically does the like front side upside front five like hand drag over this thing but the landing was like not steep and he just like puts it down so good he just has that power squat you know and uh that definitely is one of my favorite um but then there's this like drone line that we have uh, in the Pemberton backcountry, Helene, and it's just this like beautiful like bunch of turns airs off this little um, 
like sideways cornice thing, surfs this line, surfs this line, and then like does this other air, slams against this wall where it bottlenecks and just like makes the most perfect exit. So I don't know. He's just so smooth. Um, it's cool to see him do something like that, like in a freestyle technical era, but then just the most smoothest calculated lines. Often that's his problem, I think, is he's too smooth that he makes the gnarliest shit look not that gnarly because he's not on the edge of destruction like almost ever you know what i mean yeah there's uh there's beauty and chaos that's what i say whenever i'm holding on for dear life in a, in a ride out yeah everyone's like that was fucking crazy i was like yeah because i because <laughs> i made it look crazy yeah <laughs> i mean like that's what makes a sick shot though you know i mean that can be a sick shot but then when it's like too polished all the time it's like oh man you want to see that little fuck up or those little imperfections you know what i mean that make it i mean it comes down it's the same thing when it comes to filmmaking it's probably why so many like new gen filmers are like have have gravitated towards like film or or whatever because it has the imperfections and the little things you know um that kind of set it apart and make it its own thing i've always liked like imperfections whether it's rail riding or backcountry it's like Someone doesn't do something perfect, but there's something about like the clip is perfect, but it's not perfect. Yeah, Gigi's got a lot of clip like, clips like that. I feel like you Definitely. know, it's like he does like an upside down five forty, and you know he's going front five, but he overshot, so he just turns it into a seven and lands it anyway. And you're like, I I love that. Like, and as a filmer, it has like a wow, it has some hood spot to it. You're like, damn, yeah, totally, that's some flavor. Totally, man. And it's like them making it their own, you know, which is like, you gotta love that. That's what like individual individual individuality is you know what i mean okay you've been filming it long enough now have you ever fucked up a clip or oh, yeah. completely missed it and has it been like a banger uh, <laughs> um yep definitely um fuck i think even this year i said oh fuck i forgot to record um <laughs> but i don't think it was a banger <laughs> i love the honesty yeah totally yeah. Uh, I can't actually remember, but definitely I've blown some clips for sure. And is there everybody does? Yeah, that's just I think that's yeah. part of being a filmer. And yeah, uh, with uh, what's his name, Curtis Morgan? Did he ever like? Does he seems like a yeller? He's a yeller. Is yeah. it like? Is it like? Are you when he yells? Are you still relaxed because you're just like, oh, you're always a yeller? Or is it every time he yells, are you like, fuck, this is super intimidating? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it gets old after a while for sure. But yeah, it's definitely intimidating. It just gets old for sure. That's not the way to like communicate. That's for sure. It's not the the way to bring greatness out of people. I totally agree. I feel like the last thing anybody needs in the backcountry and that setting, yeah, which is so intimate and like a lot can go wrong. And if you're trying to create this like beauty of snowboarding, the last thing I need to get inspired is to be loud and yelled at and yeah, like exactly. get too intense. Totally. Hence why like, maybe the most exciting call you could get is after that. You're like, do you want to film Jake Blavelt? And you're like, completely that is a 180. <laughs> like, couldn't be the polar opposite you're like, situation. Take me, <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I'm, I honestly, uh, all the time, I feel so fortunate that I got that opportunity to do that because it really, yeah, it just let me, and it let me have a lot of freedom to be creative. I felt like, in the beginning, with you know, community project, in the beginning, that's it, that's all. Like your your solo situation, you're being creative, you're doing your own thing, but then you move into like i was saying it's like the big production stuff it's like okay one dude's doing this one thing where like four cameras on it and you're just a small piece your your shot maybe isn't even going to get used you probably don't even like the angle it's just something that where you're supposed to go you know that 9 times out of 10 isn't the case but that could be it you know what i mean so when you when i got to do that thing with Jake it was like me and Greg and we were just like being able to like work together and with Jake, he's such a like artist. So it just, I felt like I was able to really express myself a lot more as a camera guy. Let's the go. first trip I ever did actually was with Jake and Ejack, which was cool that he called and um, yeah, went to Japan and it was, uh, yeah, it was insane. It just snowed like a meter every day and you'd just be wallowing around with way too much camera gear. <laughs> How heavy is the heaviest pack you've ever had? Um, I mean, it would definitely be a brain farm one because they used to use the cinema lenses. I don't even know the weight, but probably in the 70 pound range, but like, you know, you'd be running an Optimo 12 to 290 with a map box and a red and then a bunch of batteries and the thing, like when it comes out of the camera bags, like this long, 
It's insane. No room for your lunch. We're, we're no, too no. full. Too no, full. totally. <laughs> no room for the lunch. Hey, Curtis, definitely. can I bring some water? <laughs> Fuck you, Gabe. You're like, Fuck. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sick. Okay, so media. I feel like having uh, a good group out there is like fucking key to having a successful day uh, I, or just a fun day. And as yeah. I get older, I like being in the mountains with people that I just enjoy being in the mountains with. You could bring one other filmer with you out for the day and one other like photographer. What would your crew be? You know, um, what was your favorite kind of media team to film with? Um, damn, I don't know. I mean, me and Colin Adair get a lot. We've known each other forever. Like he was shooting me as me trying to be a cool f- snowboarder. So like in, when he first got his camera, so we're good buds. We go way back and we still shoot together to this day. So me and Colin, he's good. He's He's like awesome photographer, has like an incredible sense of humor. Um, so that's awesome. As far as like another filmer to work with, I mean, I've really been Sean Aaron, he's that guy that I mentioned. He's just so funny. He's just got lots of lots of good jokes, and I really respect his camera work. He's he's pretty insane. Um, those would probably be some picks. Or and then uh Rafe, as far as like if I need a drone guy. Rafe is like just such a fucking g um yeah just a beauty person insane snow wheeler um and uh yeah just a unique individual that's for sure brothers on the run you worked on that didn't you i did yeah let's talk that e jack john jay two of the greatest snowboarders which would Fuck, that would suck to be E Jack for a bit there when you're like the <laughs> younger brother and your brother's John Jay and he just comes out with white balance and fucking standard and you're like, Oh my god, I have to be as good as that. Like, oh yeah. And then he does. And then yeah. he does he cuts his own lane and to be a part of that, to document two brothers who are the best, um, take take us through that experience. Yeah, it was it was cool, man. It was uh unique idea, perfect timing with um just Red Bull basically just freaking giving out a lot of money and uh that was a funny scenario because they basically pitched the idea with like no budget and then just kind of kept rolling that whole mantra like the whole time those guys traveled for like a year without a budget they just kept calling and being like yeah we need to fill up the account or keep topping up the credit cards or whatever and they just keep rolling so they just like kind of had carte blanche on whatever they wanted to do so I was only there for the snowboarding portions. I was never there for like the whole journey, which I think would be awesome. I think I would put up, probably would have been pretty over it pretty quick. Um, but the snowboarding was awesome. Uh, first trip was Alaska. We got to go to the Tordorillos and, and also do this really cool boat surf trip with Ian Walsh, like from, I believe Cordova or Homer to Cordova or reverse. I can't remember. And, um and Travis Rice and uh and then we went to the Tordrillos and it was awesome. We spent like a month there. It was like off and on. We got some really good footage in the Tordrillos, um, but it wasn't like all time. And then Trav left. Those guys were waiting for their trucks to show up because they the whole premise of the of the show was we're taking these two like military style like Earth Roamer RVs from Alaska all the way to the tip of South America two brothers on the run. Um, so they were getting built like in the lower 48. So they had to get shipped up. It was obviously every project is behind. It took them a while. So in the meantime, then um, Kurt, or sorry, not Kurt, um, the producer, uh, Clark Fiennes, he used to be a guide up in um, the in Talkeaton area at uh, Denali for like seven years. So before he became a producer for Red Bull, he was a legendary guy. He worked with us on Art of Flight and all that stuff. And uh, he's like, well, we need to kill time. Let's just go camping in the backcountry, this little little place or whatever called Little Switzerland, I believe. So we camped for like eight days. Um, Pat Moore came. Ryan Runke came. Um, it was like car camping, like on a glacier, like two planes roll out, like beer. We had whiskey. We had like so much food. We were kind of eating for sport at one time because like the weather would come in. Um, yeah, sleeping in a tent and just having a super good time hiking around, hitting some coolars. And then finally, I remember Clark was like, we got to get the hell out of here. Um, like my mentor got stuck on this mountain for like 20 days and we don't want to have that happen. Um, but nothing had really happened. So then they decided to make this jump and got like 
two of the most insane clips of snowboarding in like the whole thing, in my opinion. What two clips are those? Um, one is a front double ten by E Jack, and then actually Pat I think gets a front seven or back seven, and John Jay I think he gets like a back ten double as well. Damn. Yeah, it was sick, and it was like clutch, like right at the very end, this cool like glacier gap, and it was super beautiful and. Um, yeah, really unique situation. And then we like ran to the runway, had to like stomp out the runway with like snowshoes so the ski plane could land and then like load everything in and get the hell out of there. We got to get out of here. We get trapped. Yeah. You're like, fuck that actually happened to somebody. We do actually have to get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want it. He, Clark was freaking out. He had the sat phone. He's just pacing around like, we're not getting stuck out here. Fuck. I mean, that happened. That happened at Natural Selection last year or whatever. Yeah, totally. And dude's got like three days, I think, right? Eight, I heard. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. But like they had the food and everything was dialed, obviously, because yeah. Liam obviously thinks about all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, fuck. It, and it wasn't any, like all the riders got out, all the media got out. It was just like the yeah. the grounds crew and the people that are kind of helping everything, you know, happen. Yeah, Which, Totally. Apparently they had fun. They looked at the stars and said some jokes and then it was, <laughs> they had good food. So yeah, it's a, it's a story in life. Um, yeah. So anyways, and then after that, I went home, those guys got their truck a little bit later, took the drive. They did the drive all the way down to like Nicaragua, but I think it turned into like almost a vacation at that point. They're like, snowboarding's done sick. We're hitting the beach. And they'd produce some edits that were like, Okay, we're just like doing this, but the money kept flowing. They kept doing it. They're super lucky. And then they got as far as Nicaragua and then they like winter was ending in Chile. So they're like, shit, we got to get down there. So they flew down and then I flew down and met them. And then, yeah, we spent like two weeks, uh, basically a little bit of heli time, a little bit of ski resort time. It wasn't the best, but they turned it into something. Sounds like two brothers who figured out a loophole to have a hell of a trip. Oh, man. Honestly, <laughs> like after that whole thing, like years later, every year, everybody's always making comments like, you're two. What's going on? Are we going to do this again? <laughs> Just full crickets. Nobody wants anything to do with it. <laughs> Red Bull's like, oh, we overspent on that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, John and Eric, Eric are at uh, Burning Man, and uh, <laughs> it was like, who's paying for this? <laughs> Definitely John. I don't think Eric's going to Burning Man. What's your favorite style of film to work on? Like, if you had, like, a perfect film to work on, do you like to do, like, video parts? Do you like to just do, like, mix and match? Like, do you do documentary? I think, like, I think there's, yeah, for me, as a viewer, I don't, I'm don't. i not drawn towards a video part one uh, style uh, movie just because I don't see the snowboarding going down like that. I don't picture myself snowboarding going down like that, like a day out there, you know what I mean? Like, I kind of like the idea of it, like, being relatable to, like, when I'm out there snowboarding. So it's me and my friends, and we're having a time, you know what I mean? So I think, the like, the jam style is cool. And I like a little bit of, like, talking, a little bit of, like, interaction, like, knowing a little bit more about, like, the snowboarders, or at least a naturally how it would go down. That's just my two cents on it. What are a couple... <clears throat> of your favorite snowboard videos that you like kind of draw maybe some inspiration from or you just like the editing a lot or the filming that maybe you weren't a part of um geez i don't know man i mean i love like the old snowboard movies for sure like the garden was my movie that i watched like a zillion times you know um but i guess that's not really as relatable these days i honestly i'd have to think about that one not totally sure. I think uh, I really liked uh, Nicholas's movie, but it was so far out there that it just kind of lost a lot of people. But I love the film. Like, I just love his snowboarding. So for me, that's that's just it, you know. Nicholas's snowboarding is the fucking best. I love the, like, honestly, David Benedict's films, insane. Like, even past the robot food ones or whatever, all the other ones he did, like 91 Words and... and um, 91 words is so good. Insane film. It's cool because it had like a story. It had storyline. It had segments and it had a little bit of premise to each one. You know, it was really, really cool. Very well done. He's such a, uh, such a unique individual and so like on it with everything that he does. Yeah. I think that he, he's got a gift. He's just somebody who's just like good at life and everything that comes with it. I feel like his snowboarding was like, you know, he, he arguably was his, like, he's up there with Travis, and then he just stopped. Dude, it 
blew me away that he just stopped. I was like, man, what's going on? Kind of the same with Lucas Huffman, you know? Um, he was the same thing. And then he made, uh, what's his, what's the film that he made? Um, damn, with like Jake Price and Shandy. With oh, the book. Uh, IR-77. IR-77. That was another yeah. one of my favorite movies. Oh, Shandy's it, Enders? Yeah, so oh, insane. Yeah. So sick. Yeah, I love those style films. I I just like a little bit more substance. And I love love snowboarding where it's like not trying so hard, you know? Yeah. I like I like the this is kind of just a random one, but just throwing out some stuff here. I always felt like Mikey like did those like powder hounds and he did eight mile. And yeah, those like, are great. I like videos that have like it's like, yeah, there's good riding in it, but it shows that snowboarding is just fucking fun. Totally. And it's like one big joke that we're all obsessed with it and have devoted our entire lives to this thing. It's fucking hilarious. So yeah. like I want to see people like laughing and like landing on their heads. And it's like when it's too serious, it's like totally I don't want to get emotional when I'm watching a snowboard video. I want to get like this is hilarious. Let's go snowboarding tomorrow because this shit's so fucking fun. Yeah, 100 percent. That's a really good uh that's a really good like uh, point. Those movies were like insane with the vibe, and that's what like really it's all about in the end. You know what I mean? That's what we're trying to do as like snowboarders and as filmmakers. It's trying to inspire people to go snowboarding. So I think that lightheartedness comedy always wins, right? Hundred percent. So you've been filming riding forever. Um, in your opinion, what makes a rider stand out on film? Um, geez, I mean, there's so many, uh, there's obviously a lot of snowboarders out there doing it or whatever, but I think, I think it's important for the rider to like really understand what the camera is doing as well, you know, and the lighting and, and really just kind of accept that or bring that into like what they're going to do. Um, I think you definitely see it with like Mikey and Mark. Mikey Rance and Mark Solers, those guys are really good at like, oh, I think this would be a cool shot because they've been doing it forever and they've seen it. They've seen what works and what doesn't, you know what I mean? Um, Blava, very good at that. Nico, super good at that. Like definitely knows the the, the lighting and the, and the terrain or whatever. A lot of those guys are kind of tripping out half the time and looking at stuff and, you know, taking in the nature as well. And then it all comes around. But yeah, I think just understanding what the camera is going to do is such a big part of it. Totally. And being able to like communicate with your filmer like, hey, I'm going to be coming on to this shadow line. Totally. And I'm going to do a heel side turn there. The The new one that's uh, this is just a quick tip for anybody who's just starting to get out there is when you're at the bottom of the face that you're going to ride, take a photo on your iPhone and then just draw a line in the, the editing tool with like, you know, a red line and then show your filmer. Totally. It's like unless you already have like a strong rapport with your filmer and you're like able to talk through. But if ever I'm filming with a new filmer, which happens all the time, mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, maybe he doesn't get my lingo. Like maybe we talk a little bit differently and there's nothing worse for the rider and the filmer to do a good run. And then the filmer's like, I didn't fucking get that. Like you feel horrible. They feel horrible. Exactly. You're both like, fuck, like what? Like that was an amazing turn, but I thought it was a different shadow line. Um, to be able to communicate that before you go, especially when it's one of those like special moments where the sun's just dipping and you can't fuck up the shot. It's better to take the 30 seconds to actually like communicate how you're going to ride that than the five minute shuttle run you're going to have to do to try and get up there again before the sun's gone. 100%. Communication is everything. You know, it's like it makes the biggest difference. And that's a really good point. Like using the using the phone um, and using markup and drawing the line and everything like that. And I mean, yeah, I think especially in the beauty shots that really makes a difference or anything that's like a little bit more technical versus like an A to B, you know what I mean? I heard Jamie Lynn um, say one time that back in like the nineties, they would take Polaroid photos Yeah, totally. and then like wave it around. And sometimes you'd take a shitty Polaroid photo and then you're like, <laughs> fuck it's not, where's my line? <laughs> I think about that all the time, them doing that. Cause man, you use a Polaroid camera like from a distance and like you can't zoom in on it and you're looking <laughs> at it and through like a heli glass, like that's got to be, that's like the worst way to do it. They must have like the big Polaroids too, like the huge one where you could just like get this giant picture coming out. But that's a really like uh, awesome thing that the iPhone came around and the camera got introduced. I mean, 
the worst thing about the iPhone for me, if I was a filmer, is watching everybody around you document the snowboarding. Oh, yeah, totally. So let, let's talk about that quickly because this is like your profession. This is your moneymaker. You see, yeah. like, you're out, and now you've been filming with Burton a long time. So all these Burton riders, Zoe, everybody's got a nice iPhone. They're making money. They got the <laughs> new one. with like It's like, you know, it's 4K, and totally. they're beside you, and then they're going to throw it up on the gram right after. Yeah, like, totally. Where do you draw the la- line in the sand here? I don't think there's any drawing the line in the sand. It's like... You know, I've been told by uh, upper management of Burton um, that basically like the stuff that performs the best is the iPhone footage, like on Instagram and stuff like that. Like my beautiful, like backlit red shot, whatever. You with just snow. throw your red right at the wall. You're oh, like, what yeah. the fuck this, this thing's camera? done. <laughs> but I mean, I think it's cool that that is the way because honestly, social media is this thing that just flies in and out, flies in and out. There's not that much anything that really like resonates and the best stuff that I see at least these days or the stuff that brings me in the most is like honestly reposts of like old clips and stuff like that it's like that that stuff that's already happened a long time ago like for me the iPhone stuff doesn't really resonate and I guess it's like a certain audience but for them as far as like performing with like engagement it's like the the iPhone clips are the ones that do it and hopefully like my footage goes to something that's like got a little bit more meaning or is going to be a bit uh part or a part of a bigger picture thing totally timeless you could say you know yeah, i mean hope. if you make a good film yeah we hope you know the insta it's like scrolling through instagram now you're just scrolling it's like i don't sometimes somebody asked me what i just scrolled through yeah and what i just liked i'd be like i couldn't fucking tell you yeah exactly it's it's kind of crazy and with the algorithms and stuff you even if you want to find the this like some new inspiring stuff i'm just getting like targeted with ads anyways um it's interesting actually i was on a trip with zoe in the spring and we were like talking about like film or i, I was actually just chatting about this uh like kiwi filmmaker that i had met um and i wanted to hire him but it just didn't work out and i was like oh he's super talented and she's like oh yeah this this I just saw this mountain bike film that just came out in New Zealand and it's um like insane at it like it's totally different than anything I've ever seen so I actually saw like um a post from a friend of mine who is another mountain bike filmmaker and he just said like this is insane I was in New Zealand I saw it you got to support it so I sent it to her and I was like is this it and she's like oh yeah that's the one that's the one so I went on it and I was like okay how do I buy it or whatever just thinking that I get a digital download but the way they did it, which I thought was pretty cool because I hadn't seen this in a while, is um, they basically, like, if you're going to buy it, if you want to see it, you got to order it. And it comes with, like, a book. It was, like, 50 bucks or something like that. But you get the book, which is, like, during the whole project that they made. It's this cool, like, paperback that's, like, really sick. And then you get a USB key, and they mail it to you. And the first thing it says is, please do not upload this film. We... Uh, work too fucking hard to have some goop posted or something like that and honestly it's like the sickest mountain bike film like sure the mountain biking isn't as top level as like watching brendan semenek do his thing or whatever but it's super sick and the editing is insane and the filmmaking was insane so i definitely appreciate like the effort that went into it and how it's like this one thing that isn't going to get lost because it's something that you have you know what i mean and i hope that that gets adopted a bit more and like we open our minds and just start like doing more things like that that have like more mean then it's just going to end up on youtube or it's just going to be a part of the instagram like you know whatever we're just going to use all our clips and we're just going to fucking put them out once a month or whatever you know what i mean you don't want people watching clips alone on their phones it's yeah. like to me the best thing about like the skate movies the snowboard movies i watch it's like you go over to a homie's house you put the dvd in, yeah, dude. you and your five best friends are watching it in the basement and you're like yeah. cheering and laughing and making jokes the whole time or whatever or a video premiere and you're with the whole community and it's like you can feel when a video part's on and you know when that guy last year overcame this injury and he's back and totally he hasn't, and it's like that to me is like way more important than scrolling and watching individual clips alone while I'm hunched over on my couch when I should be doing something else. It just devalues it. And like, it's, it, it, I don't want it to be a cry like, Oh, it devalues it. And this is our world and blah, 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 blah. 
but it devalues it for everything. It, I think even for yourself as a viewer, it devalues it. You know what I mean? You're not getting the full experience. You're getting the shitty little experience off this. You know what I mean? And it's, it's not the best it can be. And I think it's not even going to impact you the way it should. It's not going to like make you fall in love with something the way you should. You know what I mean? It's just like, you looked at it, you're like, Oh, I'm so in love with that. And then you just go like that and it's gone. And the reason why we're fucking addicted to it, I was listening to a, uh, a, a podcast on uh, Lexi Friedman, and he was talking with this guy who's from Silicon Valley who used to work at Facebook and TikTok and everything like that. And he's just, he explains so well how many billions and billions and billions of dollars are going into the phone to keep you on the phone longer, yeah, if not totally. trillions. It's like there's never been a thing where so much money is invested in keeping you on this fucking thing. Crazy. And so there's no, it's not going to get less addictive no totally there, there there's it's not too just gonna much give money up. on that thing so it's only gonna get worse so it's like you really have to be like self-aware that it's like they're putting and this guy straight up says nobody i'm friends with who works at facebook twitter instagram allows their kids or whatever to even have these things no until way. a certain age it's like yeah nobody I bet, man, it's like so repercussions damaging. are gnarly, you know, you got to see it. It's like everybody's hunched over. It's like chiropractic <laughs> business is going to be fucking popping off. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I'm walking down the street yesterday and it's me and my, uh, my fiance, Chell, and we're walking, we're both looking at our phones. We didn't even know this. Yeah. We're both looking and then we look up cause we're like, and we have our dog and the dog's dragged. <laughs> like we just look like two stupid idiots. Yeah. And I look up and there's probably a guy that's like 70, 75 you know, just going on a walk with yeah. his dog. He's got a phone. He probably doesn't even have it. And he's just, he's looking at us. He's like, holy, f his voice, his face said like, holy it fuck. It said it he, all. Like, that's the new, that's the new world. Totally. I'm so glad I'm not a part of that. Totally. And I even was like, I'm just old enough to know what the old world felt like. And I was like, oh, the old world. I should know better. I should know better. Yeah. Like, I'm on a walk with my chick and I got my dog and I'm on my phone right now. Like, this is fucked. Totally, man. I just went on. <clears throat> we just left for a wedding or whatever. And I said I was going to delete the app because we went on a trip to Mexico and I deleted the app. And I was like, fuck, yeah, I got like 10 days away from having really any social media so it was pretty sweet i still did emails and whatever and i still find myself like looking for it because i'm all addicted <laughs> uh but it wasn't the same you know and then i was just on this trip and i yeah at the end of it now that i think about it it was like man i said i was gonna do that and i completely forgot and fucking got sucked in all right let's steer this back you've been filming burton for a while you've been filming an amazing crew there who have you been filming spending your time with over the last couple years and who's been you know, who's been stoking you out? What like who's, yeah. who's standing out in that crew? Because there's a lineup of heavy hitters in that uh in that family right now. Yeah, totally. Um I mean, um it's such a sick crew. I you know, I I don't really have a connection with Burton at all until like I got the opportunity to like start working with them a bit and then eventually like have spending my winters with them. But um it's such a tight knit crew. You can tell like with all the riders, with riders that come from out of town and in town and stuff, there's such a like, there's such a family and such a like community bond through the brand. I think just, I don't know. It just has so much heritage that they, they really like all connect. So it's pretty cool in that sense. Um, yeah. I, like I was saying before, like Mikey Rents and Mark Solers, those guys, their mentorship is like, so invaluable it's insane and i i like praise them so much because they're so smart and it's mind-blowing how well they know the whistler backcountry like i think i explained that i spent a lot of time in the u.s with like travis and the brain farm crew or whatever and i didn't really get that era and then when i came back i was with blavelt who was just doing kind of free riding really so i never i don't even know where the jumps are honestly like i don't until like two years ago, I didn't even know where junk comp was. You know what I mean? Like I had been looking at it for so long, but had no idea. Um, That's kind of sick. Yeah, totally. So it was just, uh, it was interesting coming back and going with those guys. They blow my mind. Um, it's cool. They seen them with like Mikey Cicerelli firsthand because basically I started working for them full time during COVID because no Americans could get in. And obviously everybody wants to be in BC and, as far as like a brand trying to get good um, like video footage and stuff like that, like you want to be in BC. So it was kind of our own team. It was us three, us four, I should say. 
Um, so super stoked. It was it was really cool, and it was really cool. It was Mikey's kind of second year in the backcountry, first year in the backcountry. No, first year in the backcountry, really full on. Um, he, I think that's when he was doing the uh, King Snow movie, but we got to shoot together a bunch in the beginning as well. And um, yeah, just seeing that mentorship was insane. Um, basically, to answer your question, like Mikey Cicerelli to me is like such a hardworking, smart snowboarder and and his skills just like translate so well to like the Whistler backcountry and just like the terrain. He's such a good free rider and such a good like ambassador of the sport. So I'm like super hyped on him. Um, obviously, I've always been a like a fan of transition. So getting to spend time with uh, Ben Ferguson has been like a real treat. Like I love his like strength and his just his attitude and such an insane snowboarder like um all around and it's so cool to see him free riding and everything because he's just like got that speed and that power and it's really really cool um but uh yeah and then Mikkel Mikkel is like when it comes down to amount of time filming and footage that comes out of it he's probably like top earner for sure like he just gets it done and I was looking at just like our footage from this year and we didn't really have that many days and he has such like really really cool footage and he's just hilarious to be with, um, obviously. Yeah, funny dude. And actually, I got some insane days with Zoe, which is so fucking cool because uh, she did, yeah, just got to step up and kind of do some stuff that she had been wanting to do. And I got to be there and be a part of it. So it was really, really sick. And uh, yeah, the girl is just like hilarious and down to earth and, and really, really sick. So, cool. and obviously, uh, sorry, All, I mean, the whole squad, Danny, Brock, uh mark like it's insane those guys are all fucking awesome yeah that's that's a good crew too and the mm -hmm. more i spend time with them i'm just like damn like they all are like so they're so like involved in like the backcountry aspect of snowboarding yeah. right now and they clearly had the right men like all of them have the right mentors and are kind of looking up to the right like whoever because they all kind of have the same vibe and approach to like the backcountry mountain and it's like what i like similar like to like all uh great teams i feel like you know vans always had like a really good team with good mentors and when you have those older mentors that can help like you know the younger people in your team kind of like figure out their lane and tell them kind of like devin for example like with Ika with dc like it's unfortunate it's really sad that Devin's still not on DC. He should have been on like a lifer. Like he curated that entire brand. Like he, I he could not agree more. It's like the reason why DC was sick is because everybody flew out to Whistler and they're like, Devin, what do we do? And then he made 10 years of footage for that brand. Exactly. It's like, they didn't know where to go. They didn't know the speed for things. And now you have like Mikey and, and Mark there and you have like, and then the same thing with like Vans when you have people like Pat Moore and Jamie Lynn and Brian Agucci and totally and that whole like the mentor figures on brands are so fucking important. It's so sick. And you you nailed it there. I mean, even Blavelt, like he says, like his first time, like free I think he says it in a movie or whatever. He's like, Oh, I wanted to hit this one thing. And Dev was like, Hey, yeah, you could hit that, but like, why don't you come off this corner, let's do this turn against this bank and then hit that thing? You know what I mean? Um, people like that. And then, like you said too, I think it's so valuable. It's cool to see brands like Vans, like elevate Jamie and Gooch and like bring them up because really like, you know, I'm in my forties and I'm a, I'm a lover of snowboarding and there's a lot of dudes my age. Like we're, we were in the heyday. Like our, our era was there when it was fucking popping off the best times, you know? So those guys were the kings then. So for us to like see those dudes still being a part of it, it's like, fuck yeah, that means something, you know? It does. And it totally, I think it's, uh, every brand right now is really numbers focused. Mm -hmm. You know, how many views on Instagram, how many views on YouTube, how many TikTok followers, how many followers do you have on Instagram? How many views did our movie make this year? And it's like that fucking shit. Yes, it kind of matters, but the waves that Jamie, totally. like Lynn made, are so profound to snowboard culture, to skate culture, to art culture. It's like, it's so fucking big to be like, there's somebody maybe one day that's like at Volcom or whatever is going to be like, okay, how many followers does he have? It's like, fuck off. Yeah. Like this guy changed 
our entire culture forever. Like it's like you just he's just on for sure. Like the the brand wouldn't be the brand without that person. Like totally, man. The analytics of it all, especially Jamie Lynn. Like totally, with they, bands like the, fuck. They don't. Uh, I don't feel like they have the. It it's not a true like read of what's actually going on but like you ask anybody these days like who's your favorite snowboarder i you know i bet half of them say ben fergus like you know he's just one of those dudes that like has it and like you watch him snowboard and he's just got the power and the style and and whatever he does is gold you know so it's like guys like that are like the new era of that you know what i mean so it's even ben starting to he's been around a long time he started freaking young i think he's like one of the longest burton pros out there i think it's like mikey ferg and mickle but those dudes they all they're getting to a mentor stage like this year when i was talking about zoe trying to do her thing like rents and mickle had brought her to this jump that was like perfect for it you know they were like okay you want to do this trick this is it this is the spot okay we're we're gonna set it up what do you think so this is what we're thinking do you think so she's like yep totally and at the end of the day they mentored mentored her and helped her get and achieve what she was gonna do but they've done that for so many people, you know, even though they're still young and in their prime, um, they're doing it, you know, it's cool. You can't get rid of that. It just will go nowhere if you do, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I've, I've had so many amazing mentors. I mean, Devin, like I didn't even get to spend that much time with him. I wish I did, and, man. And like every time I hung out with him, I would take something from him. I I'd be like, I was so like a sponge being like, this guy is like, somebody I looked up to so much for my style for mm-hmm. just navigating his career for like the way he navigated snowboarding so tastefully. And he never got like, there's no point where his people were like Devin Walsh is whack. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, totally. it's like everything about him was like, so who I wanted to be. So when you hang out with people like that, you're like, damn, like, how does this guy hang out? How does he talk to people? It's like, totally. And it was like, I look at like my career that I don't even think it would happen without people like that. Cause mm-hmm. I just like, they don't know this, but it's like, I was watching them from afar or like when we're on a trip and it's like, they're giving everybody the time of day. And they're, and they also like, I'm young and I'm like, yeah, you, you were from the wildcats. All you do is drink all day. <laughs> but then when it's time to fucking work and show that you can fucking hang, you can snowboard, you can work hard. It's like, yeah, he shows the fuck up and yeah, you're like, totally. And I'm there being like, wait, you don't just drink all the time and just go film when you can. It's like, no, there's like a day to film and you better show up if it's going to be sunny that day yeah, and not totally. be hung over and fucking get to the parking lot early and fucking work all day mm-hmm. and get those clips or it's like, I don't know. Totally. Yeah, the amount that goes into it is is huge and you know, you can buy the sled, buy the truck and you know, a lot the time and get all the fucking way out there and without knowing anything, but like having those opportunities to have somebody that has done it all or knows something that basically takes you the extra mile and makes it fucking happen for you, like that's so freaking valuable and not like not a lot of people get that. So, I think, you know, having those mentors around to make sure that that still happens is just so important, you know, and it looks good. It's like, it's the best looking thing for sure. I totally agree. I think you nailed that, but it's hard. You have to put yourself in front of those people, but you have to have so much dialed in order for them to like take you on. Like it sucks, but like in order to get taken on by somebody like Mikey or Mark or like, Mm -hmm. you know, Pat Moore. Yeah. It's like, you have to put yourself in a position. It's like, okay, you have to be a good snowboarder. You have to have your shit together. You also have to like, nowadays it's like, yeah, you had to just be really good by yourself for five years and figure it out and grind and sleep in fucking shitty hotel rooms and just like Mm -hmm. work your ass off and get two jobs in the summer and not complain. And then when you show up to Pat, you're like, you know, game face, like, Hey, it's really nice to meet you. And like, totally. you're fucking dope. And like, if you click, which is another thing, cause we're all just fucking humans here. Mm-hmm. It's like, you can be nice to somebody, but if it's like, I don't know if the Devons or whatever, it's like, they're you're not on the same frequency. It's like, fuck, I don't know what to tell you. Like, yeah, I'm sure totally. Renzi wouldn't want to go and spend a full season out there with somebody who's not funny. No, totally. <laughs> no, he's, he's, it's not like, it's not like all these mentors just lay it out for everybody, but you know, when they do, it's, it's cool. It's cool to see those experiences. Like, yeah, definitely that, uh, that, uh, session with Zoe was like groundbreaking and it was cool to see those guys really like, um, kind of, yeah, help her bring it to the end. So at this point in your career, you've filmed so much snowboarding. You easily could move into like commercial shit, making way more money. 
why does Gabe stay filming snowboarding? Why do you want to stay in the lane? Yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, I don't want to leave the corridor. I like, I think if I was to chase like, a, um, like a bigger commercial career, you know, you got to dedicate yourself to being like in the city and, and doing that like big picture thing. And to tell you the truth, it was like those times during brain farm, this huge like production and everybody having their like little spot that, um, kind of turned me off of like the big picture thing. I still do commercial stuff. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm totally down for it. Um, but it's more of a, like, I want to stay, I definitely want to keep filming snowboarding. I love being in the back country doing that thing. But I think the commercial world is like, you really got to go all in and just be down for it. And I, I'm just kind of a country dude. And so I think it's just more my place to be in the mountains and in the back country, just filming snowboarding for the most part, you know? Yeah. The money's definitely better in the commercial world, but whatever it's, uh, but you know what? I live in Pemberton too. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a ways away from it. I still get the opportunities. I do different commercial work here and there, but I love snowboarding. It's definitely my spot. Yeah. Mikey and Mark, I talked to both of them. I just painted Renzi's place and Mark just got back from the Calgary stampede. From nice. up, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, they both are saying like, dude, Gabe is just as excited to get his run in every day oh, yeah. than we all are. And it's like, that is so fucking sick. Like yeah. you're like up there being like, all right, like y'all ain't going to board. Can I board? <laughs> <laughs> like, I want to fucking strap in it. Like if everybody's chilling or it's like, yeah, are, definitely. We, are we done filming here? <laughs> yeah, definitely, man. You got to get yours. I mean, if you're, yeah, I see a lot of filmers. They don't even bring a snowboard with them, which blows my fucking mind. Um, yeah. What else are you doing out there? I mean, it's great to do a couple wheelies on the snowmobile. And I mean, yeah, if you're Leyland and you got the turbo and that's your, like, jam, fucking A, he gets after it out there as well, you know? He's enjoying himself. I think it's just all about enjoying yourself out there, and I love snowboarding, so got to be doing it while I'm out there. What board are you riding right now? Um, I have a few. Um, Obviously, I, I, me and a buddy started this, like, small brand called High Tide, and we, like, make these snowboards in my garage like for years or whatever. Um, I should say he makes these snowboards in my garage. Uh, I've made a few, but he is right behind me telling me everything to do. It's been a really fun project. Like um, his name is Kasha Weisberger and the the brand is called High Tide and uh, we make them in Pemberton. And Kashi is like one of the most meticulous people I know. So it's no doubt that his boards are like ride really fucking good and i mean i guess i hadn't up to the point like that we had done it i was pretty unsatisfied with powder boards and cashy came in at a perfect time and kind of like romanced my uh, my uh romanced me a little bit in the idea of like you can make your own boards and your own shapes and stuff so i was pretty stoked on it um he made yeah he makes some incredible ones i'd say the grease gun the draft dodger those are two of my favorite um there's this asymmetrical fish board that I use when I'm like doing follow cams. Cause it's like, you can almost can't fall on it. It's like drives itself type of thing. It's really sick. Um, but then I've been riding a few Burton boards and I'm like super stoked on, um, Danny's board. I think it's called the free thinker. It's really hyped on that board. It's really cool. Yeah. That's kind of it. Nice. That's fucking sick. I, I know cash. You have painted with them. Yeah. And, meticulous is like almost an understatement yeah he's like ocd totally. everything is fucking perfect so if he's making your board you're hyped yeah totally and he's like it's not like he just decided to make snowboards like he went to went to school to figure out how to do autocad and all that stuff and he designed for a bunch of different brands like he did a bunch of stuff on yes including the 420 which was like you know a very groundbreaking snowboard and um and a bunch of other for dc and uh numerous other brands so, yeah, he definitely has a good background. He knows what he's doing for sure. Damn, check him out. High tide. Yeah. Go get your shred on in the deep in the deep world and get one of those pow fish boards. You got it. You got any uh, advice for the young filmers that are trying to get in the game? Yeah, I mean, I guess it just depends on where you're going and what you want to do. I think um, for me, the one thing that has kept me like, <laughs> kept me employed, I guess, is that um, like I love the backcountry, so that's where I thrive. I feel like I, I know it. Uh, I know how to navigate through the backcountry fairly safely, and uh, and I think it's just important to keep your heads up, head up, and so just really own that. Um, so if you're into backcountry snowboarding, 
I mean, that's the thing is just get really good at being in the backcountry and really knowing the sport, knowing what you're, what you're trying to capture. I think that's one of the biggest things is knowing what you're capturing and, and being into it versus just like pointing a camera at it. You know what I mean? And, um, know where the light's coming from. I mean, lighting to me is everything. And, and, uh, it's such a big part of like my filmmaking for sure. And, and then, um, I'm super lucky that I get to shoot with like the best dudes. That's for sure. Like I've been super fortunate to be able to be out in the mountains with all these freaking insane snowboarders. They just love it as much as I do too. Yeah. It's fucking amazing when you're out there with somebody like I said earlier, it's just like when you're out there with a filmer who just fucking loves it. Yeah. It's just like, fuck, you're like done shredding for the day and you're talking about fucking Jamie Lynn's method and somebody <laughs> else is like, fuck that method. I like this person's method. You're like, this is the best. Like, let's go Said to the, nobody let's ever. Go, yeah, let's go to the, yeah, well, exactly. But that's where the fucking confrontation would come in. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I live for the banter, especially in the parking lot, man. Yeah. I, I love the lot hang at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah, totally. It's easy to put back the beers. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are you currently working on and what's next for you? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, the winter happened. It was like, you know, not a big, uh, we didn't have a big project. We worked on lots of different things, a lot of brand stuff, like brand needs and stuff like that, basically product stuff and shit like that. A bunch of the natural selection duels. So we filmed a bit, but we didn't film a lot. Um, there is talk of putting together like a winter edit, but it's not completely confirmed. Um, so right now I'm basically staining my deck. Um, that nice. Yeah. Yeah. Just finishing that. Um, I have some other commercial stuff coming up, which will be fun. Um, it just snowed in Chile. I'd love to convince somebody to go to Chile. That would be sick. Uh, I'd go with you. I just don't have any money. I know. It's like <laughs> trying to find the people that have money. I need to start thro throwing out some photos and some, like, uh, some hints and see what comes back. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. I think next winter, like, I'd like to do something big again. Like it was, it was cool. We did that movie arc last year and it was really fun to work on something big. I think I'd like to work on something smaller, um, less people involved as far as just like, it was just a lot of people, a lot of video parts or whatever, which was really cool. And everybody really stepped up and working with Danny was in incredible. He's such a good dude and such a like passionate guy. Um, but I'd like to do something like that again. So hopefully like with Burton, we can do something like that. Hopefully I get to work for Burton again. It's, my contract is through the winter, you know, so you never know what's going to happen, but I feel like we have a good relationship and there's no re reason why it shouldn't happen again. Yeah. Well, all the best there, man. Burton, resign him. Give him double, man. Stop. <laughs> Come on. Life's short. Help the guy out. Um, all right. I got 10 quick questions for you. Uh, best style back in the day and currently. Um, best style back in the day, Jamie Lynn. Um, best style currently, man, I'd have to say Danny. I really like Danny's style. Yeah. Danny Davis. I, I, nobody is bummed with yeah, that pick. Totally. <laughs> Especially like just watching him ride the half pipe. You're like, yeah, he's, you can just do a half cab method in the half pipe too. Like what the, his trick selection is fucked. Yeah. He's going to have one of those, like his style is going to transcend for sure. Generations. You know what I mean? Yeah. Timeless. Um, number two, most underrated. Oh man. It can be like, like recently or like back in the day. Whatever. Yeah. Dude, that buddy of mine that I grew up with, Chris Dimma, insane i don't know if rube mentioned him on the podcast but this dude was like he is just such a powerhouse but he would just like socially and mentally we just could not put it together um but he was insane in my opinion free riding like he was uh on a league of his own for sure yeah i got a couple friends like that logan hallbrook man the guy yeah. was just like a fucking ripper went goes to super park hitting all the biggest jumps on day one, doing all at the time, like tens and twelves and doubles were just out. And it's just like homie was doing everything. I remember T bird and Pat bridges were like, who's this guy in this yeah. fucking hoodie, whatever color he's wearing. And it's my team manager, Nick Olson at the time's like, Oh, Logan Hallberg. Why? He's like, dude, they like, he's getting the best photos, the best videos. Damn. Nobody knew who he was. So he didn't get any, any of that love. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, he's like hometown hero for Whistler fucking here. He's just, something special but yep, anyways yep. uh favorite grab um 
to, to watch. Uh, damn, favorite grab. I mean, the method is kind of like, I guess it's a trick. Um, I mean, yeah, nosebone indie maybe. Yeah. Or or actually, like a gigi tail grab where it's tweaked out like the one way. You know what I mean? The the opposite way that you think it would happen. You know? Oh, I love the That's, tail grab you film of Blavelt. Yeah. Did you that, film that in the yeah, hallway? Yeah, Holy yeah, yeah. Fuck, Insane. That clip is so good. Yeah, totally. That same style, like tweaked out nosebone style. You know, but tail grab. I don't know how you can do that. Like it's such a such a cool trick. I feel like he kind of lands close to you too. I'm surprised you weren't like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. Yeah, like, no, it was a wide angle shot. And it was like, I kind of like actually set it up and he was, he did a half cab first. Um, I was like, Hey dude, I, we were at Monashi powder cats and I like worked my way down. And I was like, Hey, what do you think from there? Like there's, a, there is a landing here. It's pretty big, whatever. But like with a wide angle, it'll look nuts. And, uh, yeah, he tried to half cab it first and went like pretty close to this tree. I think he even kind of hit it and got all sketched out. And he's like, I'm not doing that again. So yeah, why don't I just do a tail grab? And he ends up doing like the most insane, like stylish tail grab ever. It was super sick. I've been talking about that tail grab for years. Yeah, so many people, man. It's hilarious. That year people were just, I think because we released it like on social media as well, like right away. It really like got a lot of love. That's for sure. Uh, favorite clip you've ever filmed? I know that's going to be tough. Maybe just a favorite clip because that, or maybe you have one. Yeah. Oh man. I don't know. I'm like, I don't need, um, like I was saying, I like light. Like I like a beautiful fucking powder scene. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, lately there was like this shot of rents, um, in this hallway, uh, yeah. Out in the Rutherford or whatever. And he just pops off this little, like, mini little lump lands and it's just like so perfectly lit comes around does a front side three butter to a backside slash it's like the most simple thing but for me as like a viewer and just maybe more as a camera guy than a snowboarder but it, it really did it for me for sure nice yeah yeah the good old front threes and slashes eh? they yeah. always <laughs> look good scott surfer said that to me sometimes i'd be like well i'm gonna do a butter and then grab it he says don't fucking overcomplicate this okay yeah, just totally. do a front three and let's call it a day yeah, <laughs> yeah the photographer yeah um who has got the best vibe in the mountains um uh, man geez i don't know uh best vibe in the mountains i mean I'd have to go back to Rance. He's like, he's definitely out there for a good time for sure. And he's always cracking jokes and, um, yeah, he's definitely got a good vibe. I'd say him and Mickle's great. Um, yeah, Mickle's hilarious just cause he's freaking hilarious. Yeah. That's two, two good ones right there for sure. You got somebody that, uh, has got the worst vibes, maybe somebody on the blacklist. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think so. Um, all right, number six. Worst thing about being a filmer? Um, I mean, just carrying the weight, wallowing in powder with like a crazy amount of weight. That's the biggest thing that I think as a backcountry filmer is just how can you streamline your kit to where you're not struggling? It's just like what can you do to take it off your back, be the most efficient at what you're trying to do and move the quickest you know i tree planted for years so tree planting you get paid per tree so you get it's called piecework right so you really do develop the skill of like being the most efficient at everything so i think that really helped me like just manage my gear move in the back country the best i can like i'm honestly wearing my my verts like on my backpack soon as I get off my snowmobile, it's like verts on. I'll snowmobile with my verts on like half the time. People are always just like, what the hell is that dude doing? It's pretty funny. Leave it alone. It's a legendary move, buddy. Maybe one day you'll take my advice. Yeah. yeah that's, that's what I would do. I've seen people sled. I remember Mikey Pedersen was the first person I ever saw yeah. sledding around with snowshoes. I was like, what is he doing? And Rusty or somebody was like, he just doesn't want to take him off right now. And I was like, people can yeah, yeah totally i mean if it's not gnarly and it's mellow why not then you just pop off and you're just walking around you know all right number seven favorite era of camera um favorite era of camera geez i don't know i think um you know whatever i, I mean i love the lenses with film with the like 16 millimeter cameras that was the best part about like 
those times, I think, is just like the action and the lenses, like, you know, a zoom lens that had all the range that you would ever need was like this big, you know, it like weighed two pounds. You're like, that's amazing. You could zoom with it. It wouldn't lose focus. Now, like red cameras and any camera that puts a like DSLR lens on, you just, they don't have the same action. And then if you want a, a lens that zooms, it's like this huge cinema thing. It's the weight gets in there. So at the end of the day, the thing that's going to make your footage look the best anyways is your glass. So it's, yeah, I, I'd look at it more of a lens situation than anything. And I love the lenses back then. That's for sure. All right. Who is the goat for filming? Snowboarding. Filming, snowboarding, the goat. Jeez. Um, damn, I I have so much respect uh, and I love the creativity of like what Jake Price has done. Um, I think, you know, half the time shit's like out of focus and it drives me nuts and this and that. <laughs> but his creativity and his angles and, and then, so, you know, sometimes this shit is in focus and insane but it's like a beautiful mess and uh and the way he puts it together and yeah huge fan of his stuff that's for sure and that dude is a fucking snowboarder like he gets after it he's an insane snowboarder um insane maniac in life and just yeah cool dude for sure huge jake price fan yeah <laughs> do you have a goat for filming or sorry for photography do you have a favorite photographer um i mean Man, I don't, I don't know as far, I, I think I heard somebody say once that like, you know, uh, it's a look, you know, it's like somebody has a look and it's very recognizable. And I think like Cole Barish has that. He's not like, I wouldn't say that he's the guy that's going to get the fucking banger every time, but his images stand out uh, to anybody else. Like you see a photo that Cole takes and that's a Cole Bearish photo. He might not fucking get the best banger. And he's, de I definitely know he's like, you know, a little loose, but uh, he's an incredible individual. And, and yeah, his photography stands out. That's for sure. All right. Let's go into the filming world here. Um, the goat for editor, because I feel like editing's a whole nother ball game. If you want to throw Jake Price into that, but I feel like editing's like, a dude, different beast love him or hate him i mean kurt morgan dude was insane and so all self-taught like as many of us are or whatever but his editing skills were like nuts at a time he definitely rose above it's a time and a place you know and um because he's an insane musician too i think that really helped him like really crush the editing to the music and he's so passionate about the music and then the editing as well so it just, to me, it was like magic, you know, he made like two snowboard films that he edited were arguably like two of the like most successful ones out there, you know, or, or definitely hit the hardest for sure. I feel like, um, this might, it might be a disservice to not mention, um, Pierre Minhondo just in this topic and was the recent, 100%. um, a huge fan. Did you know him at all? Yeah, totally. Me and Pierre were really close, but like. Yeah, we were really close. We, well, we had a lot of years working together, like during our times uh, with Adidas snowboarding. And to tell you the truth, I didn't know people films or know uh, his previous work. I actually didn't even actually know who he was when we first started working together. Just it was Southern California versus being in BC. You know what I mean? So I, I never really watched his films. I didn't know what he did. But um his welcome series that he did, the first one with Blavelt, like to me, those are arguably some of the best things that have ever done been done in snowboarding. They were like so you tastefully put together and and um he did such a good job of archiving and telling a story and man, he just really uh he put his heart and his soul in it, into it <clears throat> and it really showed and it's kinda like everything that he did after that and I'm sure before it. Yeah. Love the guy. Yeah. Uh yeah, totally. Fuck. That that's the worst news ever. So uh yeah, rest in peace, buddy. I had some really good times with him over the years, just running into him and he stayed at Rusty and Soller's place and I he was just like this I watched all of his, I idolized all of his movies growing up and then I got to meet this guy and then he was like actually way cooler than I ever could have imagined and was like Yeah. 
he was like he had a scarf on and he was like you want to have some red wine man and i was like i was like you're so cool like okay like and then he would then he stayed there for a while he just he was filming rusty for one of the people movies yeah pretty, yeah pretty wise maybe and we hung out a bunch and then over the years would bump into him here and there in california and stuff and the guy was Huge fan, so yeah, rest in peace, buddy. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, we got to do a bunch of cool trips. We went to Japan, Alaska, really cool heli trip and Revelstoke together. And um, he was always so graceful. And uh, you know, I heard he, I, I heard he had a pretty intense side. I never really saw it. He was always just so nice to me and always just gave me like so much like praise, which is always great. You know, pump your pump your tires. Um, but yeah. Beautiful man, beautiful, uh, beautiful work that he did, and just definitely deeply, deeply saddened by his loss. That's for sure. Yeah, not a hundred percent on the the details, but um, yeah, if anybody's going through a hard time, reach out to their friends, family. Um, yeah, just love all y'all. And yeah. Um. All right, number ten. Who is the goat rider border? Oh man. Uh, maybe hit us with a male and a female here let's get a let's let's get that popping because i feel like you've been around some badass fucking women over the years yeah totally um i don't know what to say man it's uh i i feel like i would just go to my era of me being a kid and being like these are the people that i i idolize so it would be craig kelly and victoria jaluse they were just like the people at the time you know Great but I, picks. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I I only met Craig once, um, and I was, like, so beyond starstruck. Um, but I got to meet Victoria a few times and hang out with her a bunch. And, uh, yeah, it's interesting when you meet your heroes, you realize they're just one of us. You know what I mean? Yeah, another another human with all the same quirks and weirdness, and they're overthinking things and not thinking about some things, and you're like, oh, wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're like, damn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I feel like young people really get – they get hung up on that. We're like, yeah. once you get over 30, you realize you're like, Fuck, we're all in this together and we're just figuring it out. Well, that's <laughs> it. I think, you know, you become a little bit more numb to it or you, you develop that, uh, you develop that, uh, it's okay not to care. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's a nice feeling, man. That was my mm -hmm. favorite Me thing. Me too. I feel like 30 was like that, maybe a little bit before, but roughly 30 hit. And then I was like, these people, you know, don't make me feel good when I hang out with them. And then I was like, you know what? You have an op. You, you can just not hang out with them. Totally. You don't need to be friends with these people. Totally. You don't need like. And instead of this like, weird, exhausting relationships I had with people that I was like, this person's never really made me feel that good. And you're like, I don't need to be friends. with them. <laughs> It's like yeah, this, 100%. And you like see them and you're still civil and stuff. But like I used to waste a lot of energy on that. I think like when I was a young kid. Caring what I was like, certain people think. Yeah. And like wanting everybody to kind of like you. You're like, mm -hmm. why don't these certain people? It's like, fuck, some people aren't going to like you. Move on. Totally. You know what I mean? Like you're totally. not going to float everybody's fucking boat. Yeah. And that's the thing to figure out. Because I think when you're younger, you don't know that. You know, you just think that you're just trying to please everybody. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. It takes like a thousand pounds off your shoulders. <laughs> You're like, I'm just going to be me. And if somebody doesn't fucking like me right on. Like, yeah, exactly. You know, I, and I don't even, I'm not even mad at them for it. I'm like, all I can be is the best version of myself. And as long as I'm going to bed, the end of the night, looking at myself in front of the mirror, being like, you're not a bad person. That person just doesn't like you. That's all good. Yeah, exactly. Being, uh, yeah. Being at peace with, with who you are is like the most, like you said, it's the biggest thing that like, um, takes a thousand thousand pounds off your shoulder it's it's awesome for sure i think it's just a part of growing up i mean but you know what it doesn't happen for everybody and and um just if it yeah do your best to try to just remember that um it doesn't matter and we're all just fucking doing it together totally it does feel like as of late it's like my like whole like motto is just like don't make anybody else feel bad in life be a good person pretty you know what makes people feel shitty and you know people what makes people feel good and you all i'm not out there trying to overbro with everybody I'm like i gotta be best friends with everybody and everybody's awesome it's like some shit fucking pisses me off but yeah, like totally. you know it's like there's a time and a place to speak that yeah and uh yeah anyways thank you so much for coming on the podcast yeah man thanks for having me i'm Huge. super stoked to get to do it it's kind of crazy to think like if you never documented everything that you documented what snowboarding what the landscape would look like <laughs> and I just think that like f 
filmers, photographers, it's like, yeah, they get props, but it's like really this thing. It's like the, all of the images that play in our head. Yeah. Back to back are from people like you that have documented those images. And it's like, they are so important to our culture. It's yeah. Everybody since the get go, it's like everything that we love wouldn't be ingrained in our head without people like you dedicating your life to being like, fuck it. I ain't going to board no more. I'm a document this shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to be a part of it, man. No doubt. Especially doing what we do. I think, yeah, backcountry snowboarding, it's a freaking gift. Like, fuck the freedom that we have. You're on a fucking snowmobile r- racing through, like, glaciers to, like, get to the perfect light to a zone. And then you're setting it all up. And then you get this freedom board down. It's, it's fucking magic. It's insane. Yeah, it's... Uh... Highly recommend that everybody, uh, I mean, everyone who listens to this is probably bored. And so, yeah, right on. Thanks for coming on, Gabe. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, all the best. Looking forward to seeing your new films, everything you're working on. And, uh, yeah, keep her, keep surrounding yourself with the best. I mean, you've worked through, you know, Rube and Sheen and fucking <laughs> Travis Rice and Tyler Lepore. And, you know, it's insane. Jake Blavel, John Jackson, like Mark Sollers, Mike, you filmed all of the best. Yeah, it's been fun for sure. Definitely. Yeah, it's a trip to think about all that. But uh yeah, it's cool, man. They're all just they're all just people. It's doing their thing, you know. It's been fun. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Fuck yeah. Check out everybody, check out High Tide. That's Gabe Snowboard Company. Uh Gabe Langua, Instagram, and uh watch all of his films. He's, he's there's probably too many for you to watch in one night, probably like twenty or something. What was your <laughs> first film you ever made? Uh, I guess it would be, I guess it was part of Rick's movie. What was it called? I can't, uh, the high life. Nice. Yeah. Rick's movie, the high life. Great name. All right. Well, we'll end on that night. Okay. Sounds good. (laughs) Cheers, buddy. Peace. Fuck dude. I'm never wearing a sweater down here. (laughs) I know.